Hey guys. Part 15 of what if Naruto was sealed and woke up after 2000 years. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God in our history. Chapter 40. Turnabout is fair. Location. The Normandy. Bringing the Krogan aboard makes sense. But I have concerns about waking it. Miranda said as Naruto walked into the conference room. Yeah, you've said that a few times now. Jacob replied from the other side of the table. They were staring each other down like they were on the battlefield and had sighted each other. They weren't going to fight but they knew where the other was. A normal Krogan is dangerous. This one was created and likely educated by a man-man not to mention the fact that he might have Cherka. That does raise the question. I'll admit to that, he conceded. Was Oker telling the truth, or was he just nuts? Guys, right now that Krogan is locked in its tank in the cargo hold, Naruto said, getting both of their attentions. He's not getting out unless one of us lets him out, or unless Oker installed some kind of failsafe, or a malfunction causes the tank to shut down, Miranda said in reply. She's a bright spot, Shikaka said in deadpan sarcasm. She does have a point, Chome said back. We're forgetting the obvious thing, Matatabi told them both. Okus claimed that Naruto contacted him before we got there. That's a good point, Naruto agreed. I want to go over something else, he told Miranda and Jacob. What Okus said about me calling him, does that hold up? We don't know so far, Jacob told him. Actually, we do, Miranda said. I've been going over the camera recordings ever since we left Corliss. Wait, we have cameras on board? Whatever happened to privacy? Naruto asked her. He was surprised to hear that, and it showed on his face, looking completely caught off guard. There are cameras in every ship nowadays, sir. Again, what happened to privacy? He asked the brunette again. Sir, she said with faint annoyance. Gaki, let her talk, the fox told him. All right, continue. Thank you. As I was saying, I'd been going over the camera recordings. About four hours ship time before we landed on Corliss, there was a blank spot in my office for a period of twenty minutes. Well, where were you? You're usually in your office. He had rarely seen her come out of it, and most of those times were when they were heading out to a mission. I was getting some sleep in the beds. I checked my computer but I have no records of making a call to Corliss or to Oka. If we went by my computer alone, that call didn't exist. And yet, we've got a blank spot in the cameras at that time, Jacob said, thinking over what she was saying. That makes it suspicious. The way I see it, the most likely scenario is that the commander made the call in your office and then wiped the memory of it everything, Miranda. Yeah, including myself, Naruto thought to himself. He had woken up two hours before reaching Corliss, enough time to get some food and ready the equipment. That is a good theory, Jacob, except for one thing. What's that, sir? He asked. I don't know how to wipe the memory of a computer or the cameras. That was way beyond his level of expertise and he was happy to keep it like that. Lazy ass, the QB said. He ignored it. Don't try that with me, Gaki. I know you can hear me. So, what does that mean? He asked Miranda and Jacob. I don't know, Jacob said with a shrug of his shoulders. I leave that kind of stuff to Miranda. He looked over at the brunette. Well? Naruto asked her. You could have an accomplice, she told him. She sounded so serious he found it hard to actually laugh at her. Are you serious? He asked her instead. It is a plausible theory, Commander, she told him. She folded her arms just under her bust and stared him down. Yeah, but who would assist me in stuff I wouldn't remember later? You have known Gurus from before. He was surprised to see us on Omega, he reminded her. He could be a good actor, she offered. Trust me, he's not. Plus, he doesn't have that kind of skill with hacking. He looked at them both. I'm assuming that there's top security on the ship? There is, the best of the best from the Akatsuki, Jacob told him. Gurus wouldn't be able to hack through it. He's good with the low-level stuff. The high tech was Tali's area and last time I checked she wasn't on the ship. The mention of the Quarian made him wish that she was here. He missed her. No, but she did give you that video, Gyuki reminded him. That means that you two had met before. Jacob looked over at Miranda. You think we need to go through each and every one of the crew? He asked her. Before she could speak, Naruto did. I don't think that's a good idea. You start going through interviewing the crew, you'll spook the person you're looking for. You spook them. You'll lose them and we'd be no closer to figuring out what's going on than we are now. Miranda looked like she wanted to argue, but Jacob came to his defense. 
He's right, Miranda, he said. Of course I'm right, Naruto thought. Not always, Kurama told him. I didn't ask for your opinion, Fox. I know, but that doesn't stop me from giving it, he said, amusedly smug. Can we please get back to the elephant in the room? Miranda asked, getting his attention again. If she was any other person, he would have said that the tone in her voice was very annoyed. And that is, the Krogan, she replied. He rolled his eyes. Miranda, we already talked about him. We haven't talked about Oka's claim that it has chakra. I find it hard to believe. Why? He knew the reason already, but he still wanted to hear it from her. She didn't disappoint. Because only humans can wield chakra. No other race in the galaxy can. That's our edge and the Krogan in the cargo hold is apparently able to disprove that. I don't buy it. Is that your line or the Akatsuki line? He asked her. She looked right at him. It's the line of the Systems Alliance, sir. No one wants another race to have chakra. If they do, then we lose our edge and our fight becomes harder. What fight is that? We're not in a war against the rest of the galaxy. He didn't want to be in another war. One was enough for him. There's a chance that Oka was lying, Jacob told them both. Naruto looked at him. I don't think that I would have contacted him if he was lying about he was saying. He could have been lying about that too. We've got a blank spot on the cameras. It could be a glitch. That doesn't happen, Miranda told him. Not on the Normandy. Glitches happen everywhere. Not on this ship it doesn't. I think he's trying to be the devil's advocate, Coco said as the Biju listened in on the conversation. Oh great, just what the conversation needs, Chome grumbled. It also doesn't need a color commentary section, Naruto told them all. There's an easy way to figure out if Oka was telling the truth or not. He told both Jacob and Miranda before calling out, EDI. Commander? The ship's AI replied as her sphere popped up on the table beside him. Call Morden in the lab, he ordered. Understood, she replied, vanishing from sight. A second later, and they all heard the sound of a phone ringing. Seriously? Asked Matatabi. They have the sound of a phone ringing for things like this? That's just stupid. Well... Some things never change, Karama told her. The ringing phone sound stopped. This is Morden. The Salarian in question spoke through the intercom. Morden, have you managed to do what I asked of you? Naruto asked. Yes. What did you have him do? Miranda asked him. Had him to do a scan of the Krogan and look over it in the lab, comparing it to my chakra. You let a Salarian compare the chakras? That's why we brought him on board. What did you find, Morden? He asked, looking up at the ceiling. Was Oka lying? Oka definitely not lying. Krogan clone has chakra. God help us, Miranda said mostly to herself. Last time I check, Kami doesn't help, Shikaku commented. He laughs. How much does it have, doctor? Jacob asked. Is it comparable to a human? No. No. Far from it. Would say opposite would be true. What does that mean? Krogan chakra levels are far weaker than human levels. Almost primitive. What do you mean by primitive, Morden? Naruto asked. Please explain. If human chakra levels are like ship flying through space, Krogan levels would akin to a canoe in a river. Leaky 1-2. Well, this is something, Gyuki remarked. The old Krogan did say something about starting it. Maybe this is what he meant, Kurama suggested. Morden, was that last bit just artistic flair on your part? Naruto asked the doctor. Yes. Thought it would aid in description. Have read that mental images help with descriptions. At least he's considerate, the fox commented. He ignored the QB. Morden, do you still have that sample or did you get rid of it? Never would have gotten rid of such opportunity. Completely wasteful. All right, I want you to compare it to mine and see if you can make something out of it. Possibly redundant question but still must ask. Why? Oker said he got that Krogan chakra from my sample. There might be something there. Ah, good point. We'll investigate. The intercom went dead. We should kill it, Miranda said the second the intercom was off. Those four words drew the entire attention of the room onto her. What? Jacob asked. Miranda, you can't be serious. I am, she replied. We're not talking about some animal that's gone rabid and needs to be put down, Miranda. It's a clone, Jacob, she said bluntly. What's more, it's a clone with chakra. Something like that shouldn't exist. We would be doing the Alliance a favor by getting rid of it. We don't have that right. You're correct, we don't. She looked at Naruto. Commander, we have to kill it. It's a person. We can't just kill it, Jacob protested. Looking at him too. Ooh, low blow, Isaba said. They're looking at you to make the judgment call. I noticed, Naruto replied. It's a little symbolic with how they're on different sides of the table, isn't it? Chome asked him. A little bit, he conceded. One side was life. The other was death. He had heard it said that life was white and pure while death was black and final. Obviously those people would reconsider those words if they saw the predicament he was in. 
To Miranda and Jacob, he said, we got off planet barely two hours ago. I think it's safe to say that we all need a little time to cool off and calm down. I'll make the call then. Miranda didn't look too pleased with his reply. Commander, that's not a suggestion, Miranda, he told her before she could start. We're cooling off. Do whatever it is you do to cool off, go over reports or fight with my sister or whatever. When I come back, we'll look at it again. She didn't say anything, so Jacob did. What do you plan on doing, sir? Sleep. I'm tired. And you two are dismissed. They stood there in silence for a second. Then they saluted and left, leaving him alone in the conference room. He leaned against the table with his hands, letting his head hang in the air. What do you think, Naruto? Karama asked him. I don't know, he said aloud, letting out a huge sigh as he stared at the floor. It was a blank gray, no character whatsoever. If he had been a kid, he might have just dropped some kind of color on it so it wouldn't look so gray. It's not that bad. I've been asked if I should kill a Krogan with chakra or not because he has the chakra. I think that qualifies as some kind of heavy. I didn't say it wasn't heavy, just that it wasn't that bad. Please remember, you made worse decisions during the war. I don't need to remember. To having been forced to choose which place they tried to save whenever a beetle might have struck, to be forced to choose whether they should attempt to save the people being attacked or to try and protect the surrounding villages and cities. Those were choices he didn't want to face again. They haunted him every time he walked away from the sight of a destroyed place in that war. So, what are you going to do about it? Sun asked. I don't know. He didn't know what he was going to do right now, though. He was going to sleep and he was looking forward to it. He found himself in the throne room. He assumed it was a throne room because of how big it was and because of the big throne-like chair at the back, listening to the sounds of battle coming from outside. It wasn't like any throne room he had been in before, and he had been in all five of the great countries. The roof was high, much higher than any he had seen. If it wasn't for the lights, it probably would have been lost in the darkness, or the smoke if those old torch rings on the columns were anything to go by. The roof was wooden and so were the columns, but the floor and walls were stone. The columns were thicker than he was. They were circular in shape and had been carved into shapes of animals, trees, clouds, water, wind, and everything in between. They must have been describing something. No two columns were alike and they were all richly carven to detail. Banners hung from the roof. They were as rich as the columns, only in color and design than carven wood. The colors varied but the basic two seemed to be blue and red. The basic animal was a wolf, a horse, or a bear. Men and women surrounded the throne, dressed in furs and armor, holding weapons and shields. Some of them wore horned helms, telling him that they were Einherjar. The man on the throne wore armor but had no weapons. Resting on his black hair was a crown of bronze with symbols etched in steel. His eyes watched the door as the sounds came closer and his hands held tight on the arms of the throne. Do not worry, Hai Jarl, one of the Einherjar close to the throne told him holding a giant axe at the ready. The scum will not get this far. I think that since they are here already, they cannot be called scum, Kor, the high Yao replied. And I am not worried for my safety but for my son. The prince made it out to safety, your majesty. Another man who stood next to the throne assured him. This man was not dressed in armor or carried any weapons. In fact, he did not look like he could carry any of that. That was how thin he was. Naruto guessed that he must be some kind of advisor to the ruler. Can you be sure of that, Berger? He asked the man. You've heard the stories of the refugees as I have. It will not come to him, I see. The doors to the hall, very big doors, blew open like an angry god had struck them. No, not an angry god, thought Naruto, recognizing the kind of damage done to the door. One really angry Sakura Haruno. His old teammate walked through the door, just like he thought she would, her form almost hidden by the smoke coming from outside the room most likely from some kind of fire. But she didn't have her usual furious look on her face. Her expression was calm, almost eerily so. And that scared him. But what scared him even more was that when she finally became clear to see, she held a squirming nine-year-old boy in her grip. It only took one look to realize who he was. The prince. One of the warriors shouted in horror and anger. She charged forward with her sword raised. Let him go no dash. Sakura swung one punch and sent her crashing right into the wall. When she fell to the floor, she was dead. But Naruto's old teammate didn't care about her. She walked down the carpet to the throne casually. She stopped about halfway, a few feet from him. Are you the leader of this place? She asked the man on the throne. All eyes fell to him, and all ears waited for his reply. I am, he finally said. He tried to keep his voice calm and in control but Naruto could hear the tightness in his voice. 
His eyes were solely focused on the boy, alight with worry. Then you ordered what happened at Enrico. He looked confused. At what? He asked. That wasn't the right answer. Do not mock me, she told him as she tightened her grip on the child, making him squirm more. The high yarl looked at his son and panic clouded his eyes. Please let him go. He is an innocent. So was my daughter and yet you had her butchered like she was a piece of meat, she snapped back. Papa, help! The little boy shouted in his high little voice. Be silent, she told him, squeezing tighter. His voice died away and his face turned redder. All weapons turned against her and yet, nobody made a move. Sakura, Naruto tried to call out to her. But she did not hear him. No one did. Who are you? Berger asked her. My name is Sakura Uchiha. My daughter was Makoto Uchiha. She looked right at the high yarl. She was one of the three you ordered to be butchered at Unrekio. Recognition dawned in the eyes of everyone who stood again her. By the Allfather, the Einherjar closest to the High Jarl whispered. The man himself rose from the throne. My lady, you have my word that I did not order them to be butchered, he promised. But you did order them to be killed. You took my daughter from me. She held out his kid for him to see. Sakura, Naruto said once more, louder. But she didn't hear him. Perhaps I should do the same. We will make you surrender and I should drive it further in by doing to you what you did to me. Papa, the boy said once more, his voice a bare whisper. Sakura didn't even look at him as she squeezed tighter. I told you to be silent. He was silent now and his face was as red as blood spilling out from a wound. Lady Sakura, please. The high yaw begged her. He's my son, Sakura, said Naruto again. But she still didn't hear him. And Nakoda was my daughter. You're going to suffer as I have suffered. She reached up with her other hand and clamped it down on the boy's head. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to treat him the same way you treated my daughter. And you're going to watch. No, please, Sakura, stop. Naruto roared, reaching out and grabbing her arm. The second his skin made contact with hers, everything became clear. The vagueness and haziness that surrounded the room at the outskirts of his vision vanished. He could see everything quite fine. But that wasn't important. What was important was that Sakura had heard him. She turned her head to look at him, and her eyes widened in surprise at the sight of him. He was just as surprised as she was but that couldn't stop him. He had to say something that would stop her before she did something she would regret. She opened her lips to speak but he continued before she could start. This isn't you, Sakura. This isn't the person I knew. You are not a murderer. Do you hear me? You are not a murderer. He killed her, she whispered. He killed Makoto, Naruto. Her eyes were wide at the sight of him. They had shock and surprise rolling through them, but also happiness. I know, Sakura, he said, turning his voice from yelling to gentle. But the boy didn't. He wasn't there when she died. He had nothing to do with it. Don't punish him for something others were responsible. If you, they won't hesitate to kill you. He looked around the room at the warriors with their weapons drawn. The happiness in her eyes vanished, quickly replaced with anger and hate. I don't care, she told him, so long as she is avenged. He could not believe that he was hearing her say those kinds of words. His gentle voice became hard. You sound like Sasuke when we were young, Sakura. Have you forgotten what nearly happened to him because he went down that path and almost stayed there? What would he think if he could see you now? Do you think he'd be proud of what you've done? I. He did not let her start. Sakura, you have other children. I know Mikoto was your daughter, but you have more. Did you forget what Ino said to you? She looked at him, surprise showing again in her eyes. She told you to come back so your children can see you again. Don't die for the sake of one. Live, so you can see your other children. I know you're angry. I know you're grieving. But what you've done and what you're thinking of doing isn't going to make things better. Let the boy live, Sakura. Let him go and stop this destruction you're causing. Mikoto wouldn't want this. He let go of her arm and everything became hazy and vague once more. Sakura blinked and then blinked again. She looked around, trying to find him. He was right there in front of her. He hadn't moved but she couldn't see him. It tore at his heart to do this to her. He wanted her to see him again, wanted to talk to her again, and say a lot of things that should have been said. But it wasn't the time, he knew that. She had to be the better person here and he couldn't make her do it. All the Midgardians in the room looked confused as she looked around. It was obvious that they did not know what had just happened. They only stared as she looked around and around, trying to find him only to fail. I'm sorry, Sakura, he thought to himself. He had said what he thought was the right thing to say, 
He could only hope that she would do it. Suddenly, he heard a mass amount of feet running hard across floor, and it was getting louder. He looked to the door as did everyone, except for Sakura. Hope was in the eyes of the Midgardians as they listened. Perhaps they thought that reinforcements were coming, but then the hope was replaced with despair when they saw Shinobi and Samurai come through the door. Shikamaru was at the front, and he saw Sakura with the prince in hand. Sakura, don't. He told her. She didn't turn her head to look at him. But she did put the boy on the ground and released her grip on him. Once she did, he bolted right up to the throne and into his father's arms, sobbing as he held on tight. Thank you, my lady, the high yell said to her, relief making his voice thick. Don't thank me, she said shortly. The rest of the invasion force poured into the throne room, disarming each and every one of the defenders. Shikamaru strode forward, past all the warriors and past Sakura, and stood before the throne. He looked at the high yao. We are here for your surrender, he said shortly. He didn't have to say anything else. The fact that they had reached this far into the land of Midgard meant there was no hope for continued fighting. Thankfully, the high yao saw it too. You have it, he replied, still holding his son tightly. The boy was staining his chest with his tears, but he didn't care. Good. We'll hammer out the official stuff later on. For now, we'll just keep you confined to your quarters. A pair of shinobi and samurai stepped forward and escorted the high yarl and his son out of the hall. The same for everyone else, Shikamaru announced. But if any try to fight, throw them in the jails. The hall became a chaos of activity. Despite his words, some of the warriors and Einherjar did try to fight back, only to be beaten down into submission relatively quickly. They were all let out of the hall, either willingly or dragged. In the midst of it all, Shikamaru and Sakura had gone off to the side to talk. Naruto tried to follow them but once again found himself stuck. But he could still hear them. I told you to stay in the rear, Sakura, Shikamaru whispered to her. Did you think I could stay away when I could have ended it right then and there? She asked him in the same whisper. By killing his kid? He asked her. We're Shinobi. We've done worse. Not in front of the parent, Sakura. They paused for a second, probably taking a breath. Then he asked her the question. Why didn't you go through with it? You've never stopped before while in Midgard. Why now? I saw him, Shikamaru. I heard his voice. He was confused, a rare thing for him. What do you mean? Who did you see? Naruto, she answered, making his name sound like a prayer come true. He stood right in front of me. His confusion disappeared. Grim sadness replaced it. Sakura, he's gone, he reminded her. I heard him, Shikamaru. I could feel his grip on my arm. He stopped me. It's a good thing he did too. Otherwise I would have been forced to arrest you. He looked her hard. You're going back home on the next ship out, Sakura. She almost growled at him, her eyes burning with anger. I want those responsible. You've caused enough damage. I'm not going to let you ruin any possible peace talks. You're on the next ship out, Sakura. She stared at him for a long moment. He was serious. It showed on his face. Finally, she turned and walked out of the hall. If she could have slammed the doors shut, she would have. What a drag, he muttered when she was gone. Naruto stood in front of the tank in the cargo hold, looking at the clone inside it. He had gone to sleep with doubts on what he should do with the Krogan clone. But the dream he had about Sakura changed it. He couldn't kill it, not after that speech he had given, how he gave and she heard it was still unclear. Plus, this was an opportunity to find out what happened to him. EDI, how is he? He asked aloud. The subject is stable, commander, the ship's eye told him over the intercom. Integration with onboard systems was seamless. Do you think he can see his surroundings from inside? Unlikely, she replied. Current neural patterns indicate minimal cognition. Huh, he's asleep, Karama supplied. Ah, uh, thanks, he replied. Continue, he said aloud to EDI. Barring shipwide power loss, the nutrients in the tank could sustain him for over a year. So you have that long to think it over if you're having second thoughts, Saiken told him. I'm not having second thoughts about it. This is something I am serious about. We're aware of that, Shikaka said. You're wearing your armor and cloak. That should tell us how serious you are. You look like you're going into battle. I'm dealing with a Krogan here. A little caution probably wouldn't hurt. That would be just wearing the armor. You're wearing the cloak too. Of course he is, Karama said, rolling his eyes. He wants to make an impression. Have I ever told you that you are a complete moron? He asked Naruto. On many occasions that I've come out of alive, he replied. But please tell me, why am I a moron here? You look like that for your first meeting for what is, for all intents and purposes, a newborn. That's a good impression, the fox said with heavy sarcasm. Please remember, we're talking about a Krogan newborn. 
There is a difference. Fine, do what you want, Karama said in surrender, making it sound like he didn't care. It's your funeral. It'd be your funeral too. The QB growled at the other eight biju, daring them to say a word. When they didn't, he turned his attention back to their jinchuriki. Just get on with it already. EDI, I'm cracking open the tube, Naruto said aloud. Akatsuki protocols are very clear regarding untested alien technology, she replied. Does it look like I'm Akatsuki? He asked her. And we're not talking about some piece of tech. We're talking about a person. He's going to be helpful, whether he likes it or not. Very well, Commander. The controls are online. The switch, and consequences, are yours. The intercom went silent and the holographic controls appeared right next to the tank. Last chance to bow out, Sun told the blonde. Not going to happen, he replied. He walked over to the controls and stretched out a hand. With a few quick movements, he ordered the tube to be open. Then he stepped back and watched in silence. The first thing that happened was the air hissing out of the tank in gas form and in large amounts too. Then the liquid that was holding the clone in place began to drain out as well. When it was gone, the tank itself opened and the clone fell to its knees. Its first action was to spit out the rest of liquid that he had been inadvertently swallowing and open its eyes. To Naruto's surprise, they were a bright blue, the same as his eyes. Did he get that from me? He wondered silently. It stood up to its full height and looked upon him. With a roar, it charged right at him, grabbing hold of him and running right into the back wall, slamming him against it. Blue eyes met blue eyes. Then the Krogan spoke. Human. Male. Before you die, I need a name. Yours or mine? Asked Naruto, ignoring the question of how he knew he was holding a human male in the first place. That's what you went with? Karama asked him. Come on. You're doing this, use banter. That's probably not a good idea with a Krogan, Matatabi replied. Not your name. Mine, the Krogan replied. I am trained, I know things, but the tank. He struggled to find the right words. It took him a moment, but he started speaking again. Oka couldn't implant connections. His words are hollow. Warlord, legacy, grunt, grunt. He paused and considered the word. He seemed to like it. Grunt was among the last. It has no meaning. It will do. You're wrong, Naruto told him. It has meaning. It's a place of beginning. Either way, it will do. I am Grunt. If you're worthy of your command, prove your strength and destroy me. What about Ochre? His first reply to that question was to snort, which on a Krogan, is a little weird. I feel nothing for Ochre's clan or his enemies. I will do what I am bred to do, fight and determine the strongest, but his implant has failed. Without a reason that's mine, one fight is as good as any other. Might as well start with you, he said. You don't want to do that. I don't? He asked. He didn't sound confused or curious. No, you don't. And why's that? Why would you want to kill your teacher before he's taught you a single lesson? A teacher? He repeated, now with the confusion and the curiosity in his voice. Look inside yourself, grunt. Why? Just do it. The Krogan closed his eyes. The blonde as he looked inside himself. He didn't tell the Krogan what to look for. He had to figure that out for himself. It was a long couple of minutes before he finally opened his eyes, the confusion overriding the curiosity. You found it, didn't you? I did. He was still confused, but he answered all the same. If his helmet was down, he would have smiled. Good. What is it? Grunt asked him. In essence, power. You've got power in you, kid. But you don't know how to use it. That's a dangerous place to be, to have no control over what you could do with it. But I can help you. I can teach you how to use it. To shape it to your control. That's stretching it out a bit, wouldn't you say? Karama asked. He's a Krogan, you're a human. There's a difference. I know, but I gotta work with something here, he replied. And you want to teach me? Grunt asked him. Yes, but only if you want me to teach you, he answered. I could find another to teach me. None like me. The Krogan snorted in derision. You don't know that. Yes, I do. Besides, I've got. Good Kami, he was going to have to use the word. There's nothing wrong with it, just say it already. Gyuki told him. I've got a strong clan on this ship. If you learn from me, you would make it stronger. That got the Krogan's attention. If you're weak and choose weak enemies, I'll have to kill you, he threatened the armored blonde. Don't worry about our enemies for now. Worry about learning what you can from me. That's acceptable. I'll fight for you. Good. Then here's your first lesson. He lifted both feet, enhanced with chakra, and slammed into the Krogan's chest. He flew back across the room and hit the glass tube, cracking it. The cracks spread across the glass like strings to a spider's web, emitting from him in the center. Ooh, that's gotta hurt, 
Chomei said as the Krogan slumped to the ground, dazed. Overboard much? Asked Karama to Naruto. Krogan, remember? He asked back as he stood back up and walked over. Hmm, good point. Grunt shook himself out of the daze, but his head was still ringing from the impact. He ignored it and settled for anger. He came up with a roar in his throat, only to have it die there when he looked upon the human standing over him. His cloak and armor had changed into moving currents of red. They flickered between shades of blood and fire. Between the red, he saw black as deep as shadows and the void. The animal he saw on the helmet seemed to come alive within its confines, snarling and baring its teeth at him. He would have gladly responded with a snarl of his own if he didn't feel something in the air pressing down on him. It was something that felt sharp, cold, oppressive, and warning all at the same time. For the first time in his really short life, he felt fear. His instincts were telling to fight but his body would not move and he did not want to. If he moved, he would die. First lesson, never attack someone unless you know you have a hope of beating them, Naruto told him in a voice that sounded like it came from Kami, at least to the Krogan. He did not put a hand or a foot on the Krogan, keeping him on the floor with his intent to kill alone. Attacking someone you cannot beat will get you killed. Better to fall back and live to beat him later than try then and die pointlessly, he said. Understand? He eased the intent off enough for an answer from his new student. Grunt blinked and saw the human standing there, looking normal again. The presence had lightened but it was still there. He could feel it waiting for him to make a wrong move and silence him once more. I understand, he replied. Good. He released his intent and held out his hand. Grunt took it and was helped standing back up. I'm glad you learned. What was that? Grunt demanded. Something you'll learn down the line. Teach it to me now. He looked at the Krogan. You do not tell me what to do, Grunt. You are the student. You learn from me. I am the teacher. I decide what to teach you. That is the only way this is going to happen. Am I understood? Grunt didn't look happy with those words, but he replied, yes, master. To that, Naruto said, that's sensei to you. Yes, sensei. He replied without missing a beat. Good. Hey, Commander, where are you right now? Joker asked, coming onto the intercom. What was that? Grunt asked, whipping his head around, looking for the voice and the perceived threat. If he had a gun, he probably would have started shooting it right about now. Was it an enemy that was cloaked? He could hear the voice but not see the body or smell its scent. Gaki, your student is getting antsy, Kurama told Naruto in a bored tone. You might want to consider calming him down before he destroys something. Easy, grunt, the blonde told the Krogan. That's my pilot on the intercom. You talking to someone, commander? Asked Joker, his voice coming through the intercom again. Just a new member of the squad, Joker, he replied, raising his voice. Who's that? You'll find out later. Do you need something? Yeah, I need to know where you are right now. His voice sounded urgent and yet, worried at the same time. I'm in the cargo hold. Why? He heard a breath of relief exhale through the intercom. Okay, you might want to just stay down there for the next couple of hours or so. Why? Trust me, it's better this way. He narrowed his eyebrows, even though no one could actually see him do the action. Joker, why would I want to hide in the cargo hold? Are we being attacked by the tribe right now? Are we being boarded? Well, we are being boarded, but not by the tribe. It's something far worse. What? He was beginning to have a bad sense of dread boil up in his stomach. What could be worse than the tribe right now? We're getting a supply drop from the Church of the Nine. The Church of Us? Really? Asked Saiken. I don't think now's the time for an ego stroking, Chome said to the Rokubi. From what little we've seen of them, they're not that great. Joker, I'm coming up, Naruto announced. He looked back at Grunt. Stay down here until I send for you, whatever. Grunt replied with a shrug of his shoulder. He had lowered his helmet but kept the hood up as he walked out of the room. Commander, are you crazy? Joker asked him incredulously. Why are you asking me that question when you know the answer? He asked back. The few crew members he passed in the corridor stopped and saluted. He gave them a nod of acknowledgement. We are talking about the Church of the Nine. The nutbag religion that's centered on you and that wants to conquer the galaxy with you at the front, he said in way of explanation. I don't think that now is a good time to pop your head in to see what's going on. Mr. Moreau, please keep your attention on your job, which is flying this ship. Miranda came onto the intercom, taking her moment to speak. He should stay hidden away, he replied. This is not something he needs to be near. They are just offloading some much-needed supplies. That is all. That's never all. I can still hear you too, he reminded them both with dry amusement in his voice. You sound like a pair of siblings arguing over something pointless. I'm coming up. He was already at the elevator. Commander, I would really recommend that you don't do that, 
Joker told him. We're talking about nutbags, obsessive nutbags. Please remember who they obsessed about, you, Joker, I'm coming up. I'm not going to talk to them, I'm just going to observe, and that's it. He reached out and pressed the button for the main deck. Since they were out in space, there was only one actual way to get cargo in and out of the ship, through the main airlock. He could hang back in the elevator and watch them come in and out. Joker still had other ideas about his plan. That's not how this kind of things happen with these people. Trust me on this. I'll be fine, Joker. You're acting like a mother hen. The elevator came to a quick stop and the doors opened. He stepped out and took a quick look around. Everything seemed to be going on as normal. The men and women who were on shift were at their computers, doing their jobs. The air hummed with their clicking of keys and low murmurs of voices, but there did not seem to be any strangers on his ship, none that he could see. Perhaps he just needed to get a little bit closer. What are you doing? Ruko asked from where she leaned against the elevator frame off to his left. If it hadn't been for the sound of her voice, and the fact that he was trying to make an image, he might have actually tried leaping out of his skin like he would have done as a kid. Instead, he looked at her. Trying to scare me, Ruko? He asked. Nah, just wondering what you were doing, she said with a shake of his head. I heard the Church of the Nine are coming in. I wanted to see what they would be like. She looked at him like he grew a second head. You want to see those crackpots? Why? Nobody likes them. Before he could answer her, she shrugged her shoulders. Whatever, it's none of my business. I'm heading back down. She started for the elevator but then he stopped her with a hand to her arm. She looked at the hand and then at him. You want to keep that hand I'd suggest you let go. Hang on, I have an idea, he told her with a wide grin. You want to fuck with these guys? The idea had just suddenly come to him. It was a simple idea but so magnificent that he could not refuse to ignore it. Hey, I choose who I fuck, not you. He gave her a look that told her to get her mind out of the gutter. Not that kind of fucking. She snorted in disbelief, exactly like he would. What other kind is there? Mental fucking, he explained, finally taking the hand off. Now she looked confused and a little bit disturbed by his words. Do what now? That's some kind of shinobi kinky sex? How that fuck does that even work? No, not that, that's just gross, he said with a disgusted face. Seriously, how could you think of that? You're the one who said it, not me, she retorted sharply, punching him in the arm. You got a dirty mind under that hood of yours, bro. No, I don't, he replied. He waited for the biju, most likely Karama, to make a comment, but was met with silence inside his head. He found himself glad for it. I'm talking about playing a prank on them when they finally get in here. Then why didn't you just say that? She demanded with a scowl, punching him again in the arm. Gao, was I like this? He thought to himself. Yes, Karama finally spoke. He ignored the fox. So, do you want to play around with them a bit? He asked his sister. She lost the scowl. It was replaced with a smirk. They are a bunch of condescending assholes. Fuck yeah, I want to play around with them. What you got in mind? It's going to require a couple of things. The first can be handled easily. The second is can you act well? He asked her, of course I can act. It was practically a requirement for living on your own out here in the traverse. His grin got wider. All right, we'll have to go up to my rooms for a quick moment. He walked into the elevator with her right behind him. All right, people, the Niners have docked with us and are coming in, Joker announced over the intercom. If you don't look at them and don't speak to them, we just might get out of this without being condemned as sinners and told that we should die for being non-believers. Why did the elusive man put him on this ship again? Miranda asked herself as she stood before the airlock. But even as she asked that question, she knew the answer. It was because he knew the commander, and her boss wanted the man to be as comfortable as he possibly could in this ship. But that didn't stop her from wishing the pilot to be different from time to time. She calmed herself and refocused her attention on the airlock as it hissed opened. A man was in the lead, wearing an ornate multicolored robe. It hung over his body like he was a skeleton. He had not a single hair on his head. Miranda sometimes wondered if it was because he lost it all or he shaved it regularly. His black eyes were hard and his lips were set in their usual stern manner. From behind him, several men and women stood waiting, wearing robes of with a singular color. She greeted him with a polite and formal bow, inclining her head and upper body to him. Priest Amida, welcome, she told him. It is an honor to have you join us on the Normandy, if just for a short time. She saw him sniff his nose in disdain. It is no honor to do as one is bidden for his lord. You would do well to remember that. I had thought that your father would have taught you that, girl, he said to her, 
his voice harsh and hard. She would have gritted her teeth if she had been a lesser person. Amida was one of the few people she allowed to know who her father was. She would have gotten rid of him long ago if it wasn't for the fact that he knew her father personally and her knowledge of his position in the church. Although the four colors on his robe told her that he was a fourth tail, not so high and yet not so low, he was a zealot who was able to handle the church's more discretionary matters, such as the Normandy. She briefly wondered what would happen if he actually met his lord. But she put it away and kept her head bowed. Even so, it is still an honor. We have brought what you have called for. In return, we will leave two of our first tale priests aboard your ship so that they may preach the true words of our lord to your crew. When next we meet, I expect them to be successful in their mission. That is not a part of our agreement with the church, priest Amida, she told him. Having two low-ranking priests would be an annoyance. What was more was that he didn't say exactly what their mission would be. She narrowed it down to they were either going to convert the ship or get in close to the commander and convert him. They will come aboard or you will not receive your supplies. That is not the agreement. Your crew is nothing but sinners and heathens. There are possibly even travelers amongst them, he said with absolute disgust. They must be made to see the true faith. Priests, there will be no discussion on this, girl. My priests will come aboard and stay aboard, otherwise you will not. What goes on here? Roko's voice asked from behind Miranda. She turned around and stared. The biotic clone wasn't wearing her usual outfit. Instead she wore a black cloak that both hid her body and yet emphasized her curves. Her face held a regal expression, almost haughty, just like her voice. Not one of her tattoos was showing and if she didn't know they were there, Miranda would have thought that she was a person of high standards. She walked forward, past Miranda and past Amida, to look at the cargo they were holding. She did not touch any of them, choosing to look at the lower-ranked priests. Open it, she commanded the priestess holding the crate. You will do no such thing. Amida snapped at the priestess before she moved. He looked at Miranda with outrage in his eyes. Who is this woman? Before she could answer, Ruko did. Speak when you are spoken to. I see your colors. You are but of the fourth tale. She did not turn to look at him when she spoke, instead choosing to keep her eyes focused on the priestess holding the crate. He grew even angrier and began spitting as he spoke. I am the Church of the Nine's special anvo. The high priests of the ninth tale hold me in the highest regards. Watch what you say, woman, priest Amida, Miranda began. Hopefully she could explain the situation before it got any worse. But then her personal pain in the but finally deigned to turn to look at him. Don't make this any worse, she silently pleaded with the blonde. Who is your lord? Ruko asked priest Amida, looking down her nose at him, which was impressive since he was about an inch taller than her. He sneered. My lord is your lord, whether you know it or not. He is the Jinchuriki of the Biju. Naruto Uzumaki. He and the other priests bowed their heads in reverence at his name. Good. That is good. Keep your heads there as you bow to me, she told them all. He brought his head back up. We bow to our lord, not to you. And as such, you bow to me. We do not, he practically growled. You're going to make us enemies of the church, Ruko, Miranda thought. She was not looking forward to the spinning she would have to do to clear this up with him. You do, for I speak with his voice. I am Ruko, the tenth tale. I am Naruto Uzumaki's herald, Ruko declared, looking at them all. She turned her attention back to the priestess she had originally set her eyes on. Open it. The priestess looked uncertain, looking back and forth between her and Amida. The priest himself looked like he was somewhere between disbelief, shock, and outrage. There is no such thing as the tenth tale, he finally said, spitting again. That you know of before now, she replied, again looking down at him from her nose. I was given the rank by Naruto himself. How is it that he came to find you? He demanded. He did not find me. He created me. She looked at him and then at the remaining priests, seeing their disbelief. Do you find it so hard to believe that your lord, a man chosen by all of the Biju, is so powerful that he can create life from himself? Miranda almost believed her when she asked that question, stopping herself and remembering that those words weren't exactly true. Naruto hadn't created herself personally. That had been the Rouge unit who did that. One look at Amida told her that he was having doubts himself. She could not blame him and yet, she was amused by his confusion. She knew of the nine ranks of the church with the ninth tail being the highest rank there is. With Ruko calling herself a tenth tail, she was effectively placing herself above the command of the church. The Lord truly did such a miracle? The priestess asked, her hands beginning to shake. Miranda didn't know if it was from excitement or nervousness. You doubt, Ruko said with an accusative voice. No. No. 
I do not doubt. She protested. You do. You doubt my origins. I don't. Her voice was getting louder. I swear I do not. The first thing Miranda felt was a presence at her back. It was a silent giant watching everything that passes through its gaze. It was not threatening but that did not mean she couldn't feel the power it held. When she turned her head, she saw the commander standing there. He wore his cloak but without his armor beneath it. His hood was up so all she could see bare the hint of his skin and his eyes. But it was the eyes she was drawn to. They were not their usual relaxed color, like the color of a peaceful sea. No, these were his eyes focused, like they would be in combat. The blue sea hardened into planes of sapphire that held a fire that could burn at any moment. She couldn't help but gulp at the sight. She wasn't an easy woman to be impressed but she was then. Either peaceful sea or burning sapphire, Naruto Uzumaki's eyes were captivating. If she was a poet, she could write beautiful things about those eyes. She wasn't the only one to notice him now. The priests had turned and saw him. They stared at him with stunned wonder on their faces. Miranda knew that this must have been an opportunity that they never would have thought they'd have. They had heard and preached about their lord, but none of the church's priests and priestesses had actually met him. It was what partly made him a mythical figure to them, my lord, Ruko said, inclining her head to him before coming over to his side. The priestess she had been talking to made a slight fumble with her shaking hands. The end result was that she let the crate she held slip from her hands and let it crash onto the floor, spilling its contents like a creature spilling its guts out. All eyes turned to her as she fell to the ground, trying to pick up everything that had fallen. Sorry, I'm sorry, she squeaked. Her dark hair, it was hard to tell if it was black or brown with the lightning, bobbed up and down as she kept bowing her head while trying to get the items back in the crate. You foolish girl, snapped Amida. You should be ashamed. I'm sorry. She wasn't having much luck the items back in the crate with her head bobbing like that. Get up. You fool girl. Get up before I. Naruto took a step forward and priest Amida fell silent. Everyone stared at the commander again as he walked over to the priestess. She froze and looked up at him with wide brown eyes that could not hide their nervousness and wonder. She couldn't move. She was too paralyzed by him to even think of moving. The only thoughts running through her head was if she had irritated him and that she was going to die. But he reached out his hand and gestured for her to stand. She gulped, quite audibly, and did as she was ordered. She stood before him, but kept her head bowed, her eyes downcast. He reached out and touched her chin, gently forcing her to look him in the eyes. No harm was done, he said aloud, taking his hand away. I thank you for your kindness, my lord, she said, trying her best not to stutter. He looked down at the crate. What is it you carry? She looked down as well. The contents were canned foodstuffs, plain to see for everyone. Food, my lord, she said, deciding to not be obvious about it. Hand one to me, if you would. She nodded and bent down, picking up one of the cans that was near her foot. It fitted in her hand nicely, and she held it out to him. He took it in hand and examined it. She was certain that she wasn't the only one who was holding her breath as he looked it over. It will suffice, he finally said, handing back the can. The priestess took it, unsure if she should put it back in the crate. He answered the question for her. Attend to your duty. There's no need to apologize for an honest mistake. Simply learn from it, she nodded quickly. As you command, my lord, she replied. She and the others quickly started bringing in the supplies. My lord, this is a high honor, Priest Amida said with a bowed head and a tone of voice that was respectful but bordered on Lickspittle. We did not think that you would come to us. I was meditating, communing with the Biju, when I heard an argument below me. I came to see what the commotion was about, and I find it was an honest mistake about to be made worse. He did not look at the priest as he spoke, instead choosing to look at a spot about two inches to the right of his head. My lord, could you tell me on what you were meditating? he asked. Perhaps I could offer my counsel to you. Tell me what great problem weighs on your mind. Which is more important, the kanai or the shuriken? Do not laugh. Do not even snigger, Miranda told herself instantly. It was a little more than hard to do it. Her commander had just pulled the rug out from under the priest with a single question. It had sounded serious enough but she knew that he was making a joke at Amida's expense. If she started laughing, it would only make things obvious, and that would make it worse. She saw the other priests and priestesses were doing the same thing, but when she looked at Ruko, she saw that the blonde clone was smiling. It wasn't her usual sarcastic smirk when she was feeling snarky towards others, especially her, or her feral, bloodless grin she wore in battle. No, this was a smile that showed she knew what was going on, and she found it funny. Actually, it looked nice on her. 
it made her seem more like an actual person. That is certainly a question to be considered, my lord, Amida finally said. The fact that he said that showed that he wasn't a shinobi. Only from people who do not use them, Ruko told him. He turned his head towards her, his eyes blazing with righteous indignation. Watch your words, woman. He hissed. You speak to my herald like that? Naruto asked, turning his head slightly to look at them. Miranda could see his eyes burn brighter. He was either getting annoyed or angry. Amida swung his head back to him. My lord, you cannot believe this woman's words. Why shouldn't I? She said that she was created from you. He protested vigorously. The Rikudo Sanin created nine lives from one. Why shouldn't I have been able to do the same? He asked the priest. He got silence for an answer. Amida unable to properly give one. He took advantage of that. I see. You doubt my powers. Did they plan this? Miranda asked herself as she watched all this happen. He was repeating words that Ruko had only minutes before when he wasn't there. They had to have planned this. If they had planned this that meant, that meant they were playing with the Church of the Nine. They're pranking the church, she realized in sudden horror. She then started praying. Please let them not get caught. If they got caught, it would be bad for the Akatsuki's relation with the church. No, my lord, protested Amida. I do not. You do. You doubt me. I can see it in your eyes. I do not doubt, my lord. I am forever faithful to you. Then why do I see doubt? I do not doubt. His voice rose higher and almost became a screech as he kept protesting. My lord, Ruko said to Naruto. He looked at her. Yes? Would it be best for him to tell of how you created me? Why should I care what is best is for him? His voice was indifferent. Amida looked like he was struck by an offending blow. Miranda was a little amused by his expression. It was rare that he got knocked off his superior ledge. He is of your church. If anyone should know of me and my birth, it is them. That is, acceptable. He turned his head to look at Amida. This time, he looked the priest in the eyes. When I had awoken from my slumber, the biju had told me that I had grown in power. I wished to test my limits, and I found that I had none. To see I found what I could do, I took my own flesh and my own blood, laid them on the ground before me, and created life from them with my own chakra. He's certainly laying it on thick, Miranda thought. His own flesh and blood, she was surprised that he didn't go into description of how he tore it out of his body. Roko added on. I was born on the ground before him. He was the first thing I saw. I could feel his power radiating from him even as I took my first breath. It scared me, terrified to my very bones and yet, I was in awe of it. He bent down, took the cloak off his shoulders and put it around mine. He raised me up and his first word to me was sister. She plucked the cloak she wore. This is the same cloak that he gave me. Amida looked struck, unsure of his own belief now. His mouth opened and closed as he tried to find something to say. If, if that is the truth, then why were you not by your lord's side when he hunted for the Turian? He asked. That is because he sent me out to the galaxy, to learn what I could. Once I had learned, he called me back to his side and named me his herald. She looked at the priest of the fourth tale. Now, do you doubt my role of Lord Naruto's herald and sister? She asked in a quiet voice that was full of dangerous promise. He finally shook his head and said, No, my lady. Miranda decided to take control of the conversation again. Sirs, might we get the cargo onto the ship already? The others had stopped to listen. We need the supplies and we aren't doing anything productive just standing around. Amida turned his head towards her, his scowl back in its usual place. Our lord is correcting us on a mistake we had assumed. This takes precedent, he told her speaking like he was talking to a child who had gotten an answer wrong too many times. Priest Amida, these supplies are coming onto the ship. Sooner would be better, much better actually, than later. Can we please have this discussion after the supplies have been taken to where they belong? She asked him, trying to polite while also silently telling him to get a move on. You will watch who you speak to, girl. He snapped. He raised his hand as if to strike her. You are nothing. Nothing to us and we'll remember your place. Ruko reached out and grabbed the hand, bringing it back down. You should do the same and watch what you say to my woman, she told him, still using the dangerously quiet voice. Again, his head jerked like he got slapped. What? You heard me. She's my woman. She snaked her other hand around Miranda's waist and brought her closer. If she hadn't seen the hand coming, she might have been surprised and tried to struggle against it. But instead, she simply leaned into it and accepted it. We might even make the perfect couple, she thought sarcastically to herself. 
She didn't even anything wrong with finding a being of her same sex to be attractive or even sleeping with one. She was perfectly content with being a bisexual. She just liked to know when she was sleeping with someone. Amida looked like he really wanted to say something against this. Along with being a zealot, he was also a traditionalist and an old-fashioned one. That meant he didn't believe in relationships that weren't betrothed or married and he definitely didn't believe in same-sex relationships. And from what Miranda had seen of him recently, he was about a step away from being a misogynist too. He yanked his hand out of her grip. My lord, he said to Naruto. Surely you cannot let this, this thing happen. What thing? Naruto asked him. This. He gestured towards Ruko and Miranda, still standing together. The cloak Ruko wore almost seemed to envelop Miranda from the side, like it was obeying its wearer's will to protect her. He looked at the two of them for a long second and thought nothing of it. She is my sister and my herald but that does not I mean control her actions or her decisions. She is her own person. The priest looked outraged that he would even say such a thing. But he looked to the other priests and priestesses. You heard my seneschal. Bring the supplies on board. When did I become a seneschal? Miranda wondered with a little indignity. She was a commanding officer on the ship, not some servant in a mansion taking care of it. She could see Ruko had a smirk on her lips and her indignity grew. She's enjoying this. The priests and priestesses of the church did as they were bidden and continued bringing in the supplies. Amida tried to go with them, but Ruko stopped him. You do not need to oversee their jobs. Have faith in them. He wanted to say something. It showed on his face and on his mouth. It was almost amusing to see it move up and down. Miranda enjoyed having the tables turned on him. Every time she had met him, whether in the company of her father or the Akatsuki, he enjoyed lording his power, influence, and station on her, on everyone really. But now, she apparently had more than him. It was nice. My lord, might I ask you one more question? Amida asked Naruto. You already have, he replied. Ruko's smirk grew a little wider. The priest continued on. My lord, this question is one that comes from the highest level of authority in the church. I doubt that, Ruko remarked lightly. He sent her a dirty look. It comes from the recognized highest level of authority in the church, he amended. Again, I doubt that. Miranda dug a sharp elbow into her side and flashed her a look. Stop making this worse, she silently ordered the woman. Ruko ignored her keeping her gaze on the priest along with her smirk. But it was Naruto who kept the peace with her, waving a brief hand to her as she opened her mouth again. She stopped and closed it. Go ahead, Naruto said to Amida. Why didn't you come to the church when you immediately awoke? Why did you become a slave to the council and do their bidding? He asked. We had been waiting for your return for two millennia but you didn't come. Instead, you offered yourself to the ones who would keep us down like dogs. The burning in his eyes hardened into the ice Miranda knew was for someone who had earned his ire. What am I? He asked the priest in a hard voice. He bowed his head and torso to him in utter reverence. You are the Jinchuriki of the Nine Biju, their chosen one, their will in this galaxy, their avatar. You are our lord and our savior. Wrong. He looked at the priest who was coming back for another crate. You, what am I? The priest stopped in place caught off guard that he had been deigned to be spoken to by his god. He looked to Amida for guidance but got nothing from him. You, you are our lord? He said, asking rather than stating. Wrong. He turned his attention to the priestess who had made the mistake as she was coming back to get another. You, what am I? She stopped too but was able to recover more quickly than her fellow priest. She stood straight but kept her head slightly bowed to him. You are Naruto Uzumaki, my lord. That is who I am. I am asking you what I am. I do not know, my lord. At least you are honest. Ruko, what am I? He asked his sister. You are a shinobi, she answered promptly. He turned to look at Amida again. That is why I chose to serve the council as a specter. I do not understand, my lord, Amida told him. Are you a shinobi? No, I thought not, he said with a derisive scoff. If you're not a shinobi, you would not understand. So why should I waste my time explaining it to you, my lord? Be silent. He turned away from him. You have my permission to leave. When they are done, your men and women will go too. Amida was stunned by what he had seen and heard. But my lord, what about? He tried to ask. Naruto didn't deign to give him a reply. All he did was look once at Ruko. She was the one who turned to Amida and said, He has spoken and given you his permission. You can leave now. I suggest that you take it. He glared at her but did not say anything. Instead, he turned around his robe swishing about his legs, and stormed back into the airlock. Miranda was pleased to see him go. The less time she spent in the company of that man, the better. 
The remaining men and women of the church watched him leave but quickly went back to their work. It didn't take them long to finish their work, and they all left together. They all gave a bow to both Naruto and Ruko before going through the airlock. To the two blondes' credit, they kept their act up until the final priestess had gone through the airlock and it closed behind her. Once Joker had announced that the nutbags have left the ship, his exact words, they finally broke it and started howling their laughter. That was fun! Ruko declared as she held her side with her free hand. Did you see the look on that guy's face when you showed up? She asked Naruto. Of course I did. He looked like Kami had descended and declared that he would be mopping floors for the rest of his life. He replied amidst a lot of laughter, leaning against the side of the ship for support. And that priestess. I know. She looked she was either going to faint or have an orgasm. Maybe both, he said, sending them into more gales of laughter. It echoed through the deck almost sounding like maniacs having a good time. The crew on shift turned in their chairs and where they stood to try and see where the laughter was coming from. Those closest were able to see who it was laughter and promptly went back to work. Those who were farther away and didn't have such a clean view kept straining their necks what was making the racket. Eventually, they gave up and returned their duties. It took a good long couple of minutes before they finally stopped laughing to catch their breaths. When they did, Miranda spoke. Was it wise to antagonize the church like that, Commander? She asked him. What do you mean? He asked back. I didn't antagonize the church. I merely played around with one man. You played around with the one man who the Ninth Tale trusts with the work they don't want the public to know about. If they get wind of this from him, they may not like it and withdraw their support from the Akatsuki. It would not be a blow that would end the organization, but it would be a hard blow nevertheless. I'm failing to see the downside of that. Do not give him any sign of exasperation, she told herself as the urge to do so bubbled upward. If she did it, he would enjoy it and that was something she would not let him enjoy, period. There is also a chance that the church might come after you. What? After their god? Ruko asked in derision. To kill him would fucking kill them. They wouldn't have to kill him, Ruko. They'd just have to capture him and bring him into their control. After an ample amount of time and isolation, he would bend to their will, she explained. You should know that I don't bend that easily, Miranda, Naruto told her, his humor disappearing from his face. Good, he's taking this seriously now, she thought. Once he was able to take things seriously, she could get her point across. It doesn't have to be bending, Commander. They could imprison you and then use you for a puppet or a scapegoat. If we have any dealings with the church later on, I would personally recommend that you stay out of sight from them. That way, things won't get so bad. They didn't get so bad here. Sir, you pranked your own church. That's bad enough. He waded away with his hand. It just means one guy can't take a joke. I mean, come on, anyone could see that I was playing around with him. It doesn't change the facts. Please be careful from now on in regards to them. She hoped that he would take the advice. They didn't need any more problems than they already had. Noted, he said, already dismissing it from his mind. Once those supplies are settled into place, Call the team into the conference room. What for? She asked. It's high time that we have a group meeting. Let me know when everyone is there. He walked away from her, heading back to the elevator. As he walked, he shrugged off his robe with a movement of his shoulders, revealing that he had been wearing the jumpsuit underneath it. He caught it as it fell, folded it into something smaller, and then threw it over his shoulder. That man is going to be the death of me, Miranda thought as she watched him step into the elevator and the doors closed. Was he deliberately trying to be a pain or was it because she just worked for the Akatsuki? She didn't let that become a pressing matter. She had more important things to worry about, namely the woman she was still standing next to. Roko, she said. Yeah, what? The clone asked with a challenge in her voice. Your hand is still on my waist. They both looked down at the hand on waist in question. It actually fitted quite nicely and was a nice weight on Miranda. Oh yeah, it is. She didn't whip it away like Miranda expected. She did it like a normal person would, at a sedate pace but making sure that it did happen. To her surprise, she found that she missed the weight on her waist. Why was that? Ah, uh, it was better to not think about it. She had to keep her focus. Why did you feel the need to claim me as your woman in front of Amida? She asked Ruko. You do realize that's not going to help you in the eyes of the church if you're going to keep this Herald thing up. Personally, she didn't think that it was something that would work. Naruto Uzumaki was a person who did not need someone to be a herald for him. The blonde just snorted. Wasn't planning on it, she said in reply. We just came up with that to fuck with them. You came up with a position that would outrank every member of every rank in the Church of the Nine, just to fuck with them. 
She wanted to make sure she heard that right. Yep, she said with no shame whatsoever in her voice. She even popped the pea just to make more annoying. You. Miranda stopped herself from going any further than that. If she did, it would probably just make a bigger migraine for her, and she was already getting on about how she was going to spin this little debacle to the church and the elusive man. But that didn't stop Ruko. They need it. Face it, cheerleader. Everyone in the galaxy looks at the Church of the Nine like they do the Batarians. They wish they would just fucking leave already. Hell, the fact that they willingly work with the Akatsuki takes them down a couple notches in my opinion. And yet you haven't considered what Amida will think of you, that fourth tail priest? Again, she snorted. He can go fuck himself. He's a zealot and someone who doesn't believe in two women loving one another. You put yourself in a dangerous spot with him for saying that I was your woman. She shrugged her shoulders. Didn't say or do anything that wasn't true about myself. Miranda wasn't shocked by this piece of news, which must have disappointed the blonde clone. She had eyes. She could see. What she saw was that the few times that Ruko had decided to crawl up out of the engine deck to eat at the mess table she leered at every man and woman who passed by, undressing them with her eyes. The only one she hadn't done that to was Naruto, and that was expected. She acted snarkier and ruder to him, well, aside from her. That still doesn't explain you claim me as your woman in front of Amida, she said to Ruko. Simple. The only person who gets to torment you is me. It was a reply that made her actually stare at the blonde. She had essentially admitted that she didn't like her but also declared she was the only one who could. It was a weird of declaring something, even for her. Who even did that kind of thing? Apparently she did. Oddly enough, Miranda felt comforted about it, but she shoved that feeling away. She didn't have the time for it. There were things to do. We have a meeting to attend to. I know. I heard him just as you did. She turned around and started walking away. Then make sure that you show up, she told her. I don't want to have to send someone down to get you. Yeah, yeah, she replied, waving a hand back at her. That was the only thing she did before she stepped into the elevator and vanished from sight. I now call this meeting into order, Naruto announced, standing at the head of the conference table with his team on both sides of him. They were all looking at him, which was what he wanted. When were you so formal? Garis asked him from where he stood on the right between Miranda and Ruko. If things got hairy between the two of them, he would be there to run interference. Yeah, when were you so formal? Shikaka asked as well. I just thought that it needed a touch, he said to them both. Uh-huh. If you say so, the Turian remarked. Please continue. To start off, this is Grunt, he announced, gesturing to the Krogan standing at his side and glaring at everyone there. The reactions they were giving him vary but it could be generalized into either ignoring him or returning the glare, Ruko being the most obvious about it. He'll be a part of the team now and I'll be his sensei when it comes to learning to use his chakra. This is a bad idea, Miranda said. Grunt turned his head and glared hard at her. He took a step towards her. I will kill you. She was weak. He could easily defeat her and end her life. Grunt, no attacking any member of the team, Naruto told him sharply. He froze in place, looking at the blonde. He took the step back and stayed there, but snarled one more time at Miranda. Thank you? Now that he's introduced, I would to get to the meat of why we are here. And what's that? Zaid asked him. This little shadow war the Akatsuki has going with the tribe, I want it done. He just snorted in response. Yeah, good luck with that. You don't think we can do it, Zaid? Naruto asked him, his voice questioning the man who stood to his left with his arms folded across his chest. Fuck no. They're a group backed by the council. What the fuck makes you think you'd be able to take them out? I didn't say I wanted to take them out. I said I wanted the war done, he replied. He stared down the merc, silently challenging him to ask him how. Well, how do you plan on doing it? Matatabi asked him. I've got a plan, he told the Nibi. The fox snorted in derision, quite similar to Zaid in fact. You never have a plan. You have ideas, all right, so I have an idea of a plan. How exactly do you plan on doing that? Gurus asked him. The Turian looked at him with curiosity in his eyes as opposed to Miranda, who had suspicion, or Jacob, who had disbelief, in theirs. He can't, Zaid spoke out. I'm sorry, when did your name become Naruto Uzumaki? He asked, staring down the merc from across the table. I'm stating the facts. He can't take out the tribe. It's too big. Zaid, I've already said that I wanted the war done, not take them out, Naruto told him sharply. Get your ears cleaned out. The merc looked at him just as sharply. All right, then tell us what the difference is, because as far as I can see it, there isn't one. If you wanted a war to end, you wipe out the other side. 
That was the way he had learned war, and that was the way that seemed the most concrete. You're wrong. There is a difference. You keep hitting them again and again until they want a peace with you or they are too insignificant for you to be bothered about them. That's how we're going to end this war, Naruto declared, looking at them all. He had put conviction into his voice as he spoke. He believed in what he was saying and from the looks he was getting from his old teammates, one more than the other, they believed him. Others were still having a hard time doing so. Zave was among them, that much was obvious. Miranda was there too and so were Eric and Musashi, the former less than the latter. Morden was seemingly waiting for information if the look on his face, a pensive yet inquisitive look, was anything to go by. Grunt had no idea what he was talking, so he kept staring at everyone standing at the table. Rucko and Jacob seemed to be the middle ground, not sure if they believed what he said but they were willing to hear more. So how do we do that? Quan Misley asked him. Now came the part he was really going to hate. It was something he knew he would have to say and was going to hate it. As much as it galls me to concede to that bastard, we'll use the random flybys. The team stared at him for a long second, their confusion plain to see. Then they started looking at one another, trying to figure out what the words he said had meant. The fox inside his head was more annoyed than confused, mostly because he knew what the words meant. Context, you moron, he told his jinchuriki. Give them context. Commander, what exactly are you talking about? Jacob asked him. Yeah, who's the bastard? Rucko asked as well. But even though she asked the question, she felt a flash of emotion again. This time, the emotions were all jumbled together. She felt hatred, anger, fear, but also sadness and regret. Whoever the bastard was, her brother despised yet felt sorry for him. It was a confusing duality, one she was unsure of. She both wanted to know but also didn't. See? Karama asked. He's right, Naruto, son agreed. You should have given them context. I got that already, he replied. We're going to modeling ourselves after Abito during the Fourth Shinobi World War. He would appear from out of nowhere, strike his target with absolute fury, watch while it burned, and then leave as we responded. Some idiot with one of the newspapers called it the Random Flybys and the name stuck, unfortunately. I've never heard of that name, Miranda told him. Thank Cammy. That means the guys pulled through and made sure it was forgotten. It was a stupid name that they refused to actually say. Whenever one of them slipped up and said it, they got a smack. Sadly enough, there were many. So that's what we're going to do against the tribe? Gurus asked him. He didn't ask for himself since he already heard it. He was asking so the conversation could go back onto its proper tracks. Yes, minus the watching while it burns. We can do without that. How? Asked Musashi. He looked over at both Miranda and Jacob, again standing on opposite ends of the table. I'm assuming that the Akatsuki has information on tribe bases, ships, and the like, he said to them both. Yes, it does, Miranda answered. Her disbelief was slowly running out of her voice now that she figured out what he was talking about. The more she listened, the more her disbelief left her. Then that's what we hit. We hit hard, we hit fast, we get what we need, and we get out before their backup gets there. It sounded simple. He knew that. He also knew that it wouldn't be. Nothing was simple in real life. Anything simple isn't worth doing, Karama told him. Don't go quoting Jiraiya on me, he replied. It's not going to be easy, Jacob told everyone. The tribe will have good security at every one of their locations. We may not be able to hit as hard as you like, commander, or as fast. We also have to consider the fact that the tribe is going to be hunting you, and by extension us, wherever this ship might go. There was also the possibility of that huntress coming after them too, but the situation was already grim enough. Coward, Grunt told him. It was all he said with his mouth. His eyes shined with the disdain he now had for the soldier. But he wasn't put off by the newborn Krogan. I'm practical, not a coward, he replied. You will learn the difference if you want to live out in the galaxy. There was no insulting tone to his voice nor was there condescension either. He simply spoke as if he was pointing out a fact to another person. But Grunt didn't see like that. He growled and was ready to take a step towards him when Naruto spoke. Grunt, he's right. You would do well to learn from that lesson. I learn from you, he said shortly. I won't be your only teacher. Who else could there be? He asked as if it was a challenge. Life, for one, the blonde answered shortly. Now stand down. The Krogan newborn did as he was told, staying in place. But he still glared at everyone there. Everyone ignored his glaring, turning their attention back to the blonde he stood beside. I know that they may have good security, Jacob. That just means we are going to have to be better than they are. And how do you propose that? Zade asked. Out of all of them, 
he was still the one who had the most disbelief in his voice. It might be possible with the supplies we've gotten from the church, Miranda spoke, bringing the attention to her. Without preamble, she continued, They haven't just given us supplies and food and spare parts. They've given us additional modifications. Such as what? Asked Garis. Such as of the Nix Cannon system, she answered. He paused and looked at her with surprise in his eyes. Are you serious? Yes. I could have sworn that the Turian High Command had that thing still in development stages. Your news is outdated, she told him. There was a little condescension. It was a trained reflex. They moved it out of development half a year ago and into production. They're expensive to come by. And yet you have one, he remarked. She smiled, putting in a little more condescension. Our pockets are deep enough that getting a the Nix cannon wouldn't hurt us. Huh, he said, gotta say, that's impressive. He sounded very impressed. He was the weapons expert on the team, so the weapon system she was talking about must be very good. Still, it didn't hurt to double check. Gurus, what's the weapon she's talking about? Naruto asked him. The the Nix cannon is something my people took from the attack on the citadel and made it their own, he answered. Some scraps of Sovereign were left after you destroyed it. They were able to take that and glean the weapon system from it, just enough to make the cannon. So how good is it? It's got the same level of firepower as Sovereign had when it struck back at the ships. So, good, he said, wanting a confirmation. The Turian nodded rapidly in acknowledgement. Oh yeah, it's good. If that tribe ship comes after us, we'll punch a hole through it that it won't be able to recover from. There was a vicious grin on his face as he spoke. If it happened... He would be looking forward to it. That's not all. Our defenses are being improved upon as we speak, Miranda said to them. The church supplied us with heavy armor from a Solaris-class starship. All right, what is that? Naruto asked her. It sounded important if the looks on a few team members were anything to go by. It's the kind of armor that will keep the ship protected from kinetic and heat energy produced by enemy weapons. We'll no longer be vulnerable to them once it's been put in place, she explained to him. How long is that going to take? The initial installments are being taken care of but if we want to complete it fully, we will have to land somewhere with a harbor. Once there, it should only take a few hours, no more than four. Will the installation of the Denix system be the same? She shook her head in the negative. No, that can be taken care of in flight. All right, we've got a plan. He turned his attention to the table itself rather than his team. EDI he spoke. Yes, Commander? Asked EDI, popping up in front of him. It was amazing that he had gotten so used to that action that he didn't flinch or freak out at it. No one did anymore, really. Except for Grunt, that was. What the? Roared the Krogan as he leapt back from the blue orb. When he stopped moving, he eyed it suspiciously. What is it? It's EDI, Grunt. She's on our side. Naruto told him before turning his attention back to the ship's AI tell Joker to plot a course to the nearest planet that has a harbor that can hold the Normandy. When you're done with that, I want a compiled list of the tribe's known locations ready for me. She didn't say anything in reply, deciding to simply vanish. Noticed additional benefit to tribe hunting, Morden spoke from next to Zaid. He had been silent for the meeting so far. It was a little surprising to hear him speak. What would that be? Naruto asked him sounding casual yet curious in his questioning. It got his biju snorting, a virtual cacophony of the sound. You know what it is, Chome said, sounding like it was chastising the blonde. Possible chance of research regarding chakra made by tribe and hunt. If found, could be used to unlock more inhibitors. The two sentences were delivered a quick burst, and if the team hadn't been used to his way of speaking, they would have been confused by it. He pretended to consider what the Solarian had offered. Good point, Morden, he finally said. I think that I missed that part, liar Karama said to him. Any other questions? He asked them all. He got silence for an answer. Good. One more thing. It's going to take more than just combat to make us a team. So I'm instituting the dinner policy. Gurus snorted and Quan Misley understood. The rest of them didn't. What the hell is that? Zaid demanded. At least once a week, we all sit down and share a meal. That's it. And talk, he added, almost as an afterthought. It'll help us bond. You've got to be kidding, Ruko told her brother. No, Ruko, I'm not. Once a week, we'll sit down and eat together. That means you too. There was a silent threat in his voice, one that said he would drag up to the mess table by her foot if she refused. She heard the threat and did her best to ignore the shiver down her spine. Whatever. At the very least, she'd have a chance to annoy the cheerleader. That was always fun. Her brother looked around the table. No one else had anything to say about it. Glad you all understand. Dismissed. Some of them saluted him, some didn't. 
But they all left the room as a loose group. He had no doubts once they were past the door, they would scatter through the ship. You ready for this? Gyuki asked him. No one's ready for anything, he said in reply, looking at the screens on the table. The numbers and letters made no sense to him, and he didn't try to figure them out. It would have been too much of a headache. He trusted the crew to know what it meant and translate for him if he asked. Then are you prepared for this? Saiken asked. Oh yeah, he replied with a grin worthy of the fox inside of him. It was time for payback against the tribe and he was planning on collecting the interest too. Codex entry. Culture killing intent. While having been called many things through the years. Bloodlust by the Krogan. The goddesses stare by the Asari. The hidden rage by the Turians. The phenomenon. Aptly named killing intent by the humans. Is something that has been around for centuries but hadn't been brought to proper attention until humanity joined the council. Quite simple, the phenomenon allows the user to express and imprint their intent to kill onto their enemies. While sounding simplistic at first, the actual usage of such a feat does not come easily. When first brought to light by humanity, council scientists registered it as another ability derived from chakra. However, studies revealed that Krogans were able to use it as well. From there, members of other species were discovered to be able to utilize it. The deciding came from their experience. Each discovered user was a veteran warrior of considerable years. The ability to express killing intent came from their years of waging war, in any form, being able to survive, training their bodies to their peak. As it happens, humans, Krogans, and surprisingly Salarians are the three species that can wield the intent to kill the best. Descriptions of the intent have been few. This is mostly from the fact that the people the intent is used on end up dead, and those who were used for scientific research can only give brief details after the fact. There have been attempts for them to get the details during the experiment, but that usually fails because of their being frozen in place, and unable to form a coherent sentence. Chapter 41 Please mind the camera. Location, the Normandy. Naruto, what exactly are you doing? Matatabi asked Naruto. What does it look like I'm doing? He asked back silently. Where he was right now, he couldn't speak out loud to them, otherwise people would think that he was a loon. Then again, he didn't really care what other people would think at the moment. He was going to take this moment to relax. It looks like you're lying on your back in the middle of space, the Nibby replied. That would be it. He had his legs stretched out to their farthest, and his arms crossed behind his head. In any other scenario, with the exception of a battlefield, he looked he was killing time by lying around. Why are you lying on your back in the middle of space? That's a rather foolish question, isn't it? I mean, you know how I came to be in space. They saw the process happen and it was only that they decided to open their mouths about it. We are aware of the fact that you are now the ship, Naruto, Sun said to him. But you're about to do something that requires your complete focus. I know. Then could you please act like it? This whole being nonchalant in the middle of outer space is really weird. For you, you mean? I happen to find with it. Oh look, a star. He idly commented as he looked out to the void, seeing a bright light of a speck. How far away was that star? He'd do some calculations, but he didn't feel like it. Don't flatter yourself, Karama said to him. Your brain can't handle that kind of calculations. Only Shikamaru could and that was when he was motivated. He would have scowled or frowned, if he had actually cared about it. Ah, uh, you got a point, he conceded with a shrug of his shoulders. But still, Shikamaru can eat his heart out. He can cloud watch all he wants. I get to space watch. The fox rolled his eyes at that. Only you would consider that to be a good thing. He's right, though. Isabu agreed. The view is killer. See? I'm not alone here in admiring the view. Really, he should have thought about doing this a while back. He had a spectacular view in here, and he could shrink or enlarge it to any size he wanted. Next time he wanted to take a break from something... He should just come here and stare into the black void that was the space. Well, calling it a black void was a disservice. That would have implied that there was nothing there to stare at. But there certainly was something. On a planet, he only had a finite number of stars to see in the sky. Here, he could see them all and in all their shining glory. He could see the planets in the system turn and rotate around the sun while their moons turned and rotated around them. If he shrunk it down so he could see more... He could watch as the cluster of stars shifted and moved silently through space, subtly changing their colors as they went. It was a beautiful picture that had many layers and sizes. Commander, we're coming up on the ship, Joker announced through the intercom. He stood up. Which meant break time was over. It was nice when it lasted, but now it was time to be all business. He raised his hands up and spread them out in front of his chest. 
Everything came quickly into focus. The ship they were hunting came into sight and became even bigger when he widened the sight to get a better look. It was a mid-sized class of a ship, the exact name of the class he didn't know. It was about as long and half as the Normandy, and about the same size in height and width too. There was slight slope to the top of the ship that reached down the front side, giving the ship a gentle curve. But it wasn't the curve that he was interested in. It was the weapons and the shields that it might have. Joker, are we dark? He asked. Yes, we are, his pilot answered. Have they armed themselves? Hold on. The silence was trivial, not something he concerned himself with as he waited for the answer. No, they haven't. No weapons online? He asked, wanting confirmation. None, Joker answered. And their shields aren't up? Nope. So in essence, they're a sitting duck that's just begging to be shot at? Yes, they are. They're quite considerate when it comes to allowing us to find out the answers, aren't they? He asked in a voice that equal parts kidding and seriousness in the way that only Joker could do. Yes, they are quite considerate, Naruto agreed. But I don't think that the next one will be as considerate, so we should count our blessings here. You never know, Commander. You might just get lucky. Could you please get a move on? Karama asked. We're getting bored in here. You're bored most of the time, Furball. But fine, he silently replied. Joker, man battle stations, he ordered aloud. Ah, I, Commander, Joker replied. Naruto couldn't hear the alarm where he was now, but he was sure that they were going off. Awuga, 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 ga, I can't even think of them in any other kind of noise. He silently complained. Seriously, that sound was annoying but he could not think of any other kind of sound for the alarm. The biju, of course, had something to say about that. Get over it. And how exactly would I get over something like that? He asked them. It grates on the ears. Is it something vital thing you need to concern yourself with? Gyuki asked him. At the moment? He asked. No. Then get over it. I hate you. Focus, Gaki, Karama told him. Just focus. Everyone knew that he would get over hating them, especially when there was important work to be done. He knew that too. He turned his attention back to the matter at hand. Soon the information began to roll into his ears from the crew of his ship, distracting him from the thought of the alarms. Weapons coming online. Shields being raised. Enemy ship 100 miles out. Cloaking still holding. The enemy ship is unaware of us. Shields at 50% capacity. New armor is holding nicely. Torpedoes primed and ready for deployment. Enemy ship 75 miles out. Guardian weapon systems at the ready. Mass accelerator cannon is ready to fire. Joker, Naruto spoke. Send word to Gurus in the weapons deck. How do you know he's in the weapons deck? Joker asked. We're talking about Gurus, Joker. When is he not in the weapons deck? Well, it was a rhetorical question, he said, cutting him off before he could make a quip. Have words sent down to him. All right, what am I telling him? Two things. The first is to have the chakra amplifier inserted into the main cannon. Okay, what's the second? Don't turn on the, the next system. We'll save that for a later date. That's cruel of you, Naruto, Isaba told him. He was a little surprised. How is that cruel? He demanded. You know perfectly well that Gurus was looking forward to using the Denix weapon. Ain't that the true? Sun agreed. The guy acted like a puppy with a new bone as he helped install the thing. Using the Denix cannon here would be overkill. This is a research ship, not an attack one. We'll be able to board them without prolonging it into an actual battle. Remember, we're operating on RFB procedure. Did you really just shorten random flybys into RFB? Karama demanded, raising an eyebrow which is something to see on a gigantic nine-tailed fox. It was becoming a mouthful. I've sent the word to Gurus and he has a reply, Joker said. The first part, he's already on it. Naruto nodded appreciatively, even though no one else saw it. And the second? He asked. Ah, his pilot replied. Excuse me. That's what he told me to tell you, ah. Oh. And why did he tell you to tell me that? He was really looking forward to using the Denix cannon. He rolled his eyes and ignored the sniggering of his tenants. Tell him to get over it. It would be overkill here. I'll pass it on. See? I told you, Isaba said. Isabu? He replied. Shut up. He turned his attention back to the information the crew was passing on. Enemy ship is 25 miles out. Shields are online. Boarding party has reported that they are good to go. Enemy ship is 20 miles out. Joker, take the ship upwards at an angle, he called out. You got it, Commander, Joker replied. The blonde expanded the view so he could see both ships. He watched silently as the Normandy began to ascend so that it would have the advantage of height over the other ship. Enemy ship is 15 miles out and 5 miles down. All ordered weapon systems are online and ready to fire. All sections have reported in. Enemy ship is 10 miles out and 6 miles down. He waited silently as the ship climbed, 
silently stalking the unaware tribe's ship like a predator going after its prey. It was surreal watching it play out before him when he was aware of the fact that he was in the ship himself. He just had to wait for the moment. It was nearly there. Enemy ship is five miles out and eight miles down. There. That was the moment. Joker, drop the stealth and tell Jacob to drop the jutsu. He barked out the order. A downside of the ship, one that was carried over from the original, was that it could not maintain the stealth system and actively engage enemy ships. An annoying thing to a shinobi, but they were able to work around it. I, Commander, Joker answered. It was only a few seconds later that he saw the lightning bolt discharge from the cannon and arc its way towards the ship. Even though there was no atmosphere for it to actually work in, it behaved like an actual bolt of lightning coursing through space. You know, I have a feeling that if physicists could see this, they would start complaining about how it violated several laws of nature, Koko remarked. So what? asked Naruto, just pointing it out. The lightning bolt struck the tribe ship just a couple of yards ahead of the engines. Even though there was no sound in outer space, Naruto could hear its crack and boom in his mind as the ship shook. That's a hit. I repeat, that's a hit, confirmed. Jutsu has struck the ship. They are aware of us now. They're attempting to raise their shields. Joker confirmed that they are trying to raise their shields, Naruto ordered. It didn't take long for Joker to get back to him. That's confirmed. The ship is trying to raise its shields but is failing. The jutsu did its work. It paralyzed their shielding, just as speculated. Good. Drop the ship into a dive. Weapons are free to cripple, not destroy. You got it. One crippled and not destroyed ship coming right up. He watched as the Normandy began its descent, like a hawk bearing down on the mouse it spotted in the grass. It didn't have any claws but it did have weapons ready to cripple its prey. He centered the view from the position of the Normandy, just to get a better view of everything. Main deck to weapons bay, weapons are free. I say again weapons are free. This is weapons bay, torpedoes at the ready. Check weapons bay, torpedoes are ready to fire. Guardian system is ready to intercept. Joker. I want one torpedo aimed at the engines and one aimed at the communication systems. I don't want them getting away or calling for help, Naruto said. After that, fire a torpedo at the weapon systems. There's going to be a problem with that order, Commander. The weapon systems are never grouped together on a ship. It's to prevent what you just suggested. Then fire the first torpedo at the system you think needs to be struck right away. Fire the second at the next important system and repeat the process. You got it. The other voices continued their stream of information. Weapons bay, arm and aim two torpedoes at the engines and communication systems. Copy that main deck, targets are lining up. Five seconds needed. Enemy ship is attempting to turn and meet us. Targets are locked. Torpedoes are firing. Torpedoes are away. Ooh, pretty, Shikaka said as they all watched the two torpedoes fire from the ship and fly through space, leaving lines of blue fire in their wake. They slammed into the ship's engines and communication exploding into twin bursts of flame, shining for one second before vanishing into nothing from the lack of oxygen. It was a brief sight before the Normandy pulled out of the dive and flew away for another pass. Direct hit. I've got a reading. Engines are destroyed. Their communications are dead. Copy. They are dead, deaf, and mute in space. Hot shit. They are not going anywhere. Save the joy for when we are successful, Miranda's voice ordered, cutting through the chatter. It's too early to celebrate. You heard the lady, Joker chimed in. Get back to work. I'm flying in around for another pass. Joker, they're trying to do something, Naruto told him, watching the battle play out. The tribe ship might have been dead in the water. It was hard to shake that phrase from his vocabulary, since they were in the future and all, but it looked like they were trying to arm and aim their weapons. The Normandy might be out of range now, but they could fire as it made the next pass. Yeah, I see it, Commander, he replied. Don't worry, it won't be a problem. The chatter started up again almost immediately. Weapons bay, load second torpedo salvo. Torpedoes are being lorded, turning into second attack pattern. Torpedoes are lorded and targets are being lined up. Ten seconds needed. Enemy ship is trying to ready weapons. Targets are locked. Torpedoes are firing. Torpedoes are away. Two more torpedoes fired from the ship as it made its second pass, flying right at the enemy ship and taking out their intended targets. Naruto could hear whoops of joy as the fires vanished and the weapon systems laid there destroyed. That's a direct hit again. Weapon systems have been destroyed. Joker, ready for boarding action, Naruto ordered. I'm disengaging full immersion to join my team. He was all ready to stop the chakra flow. Actually, Commander, could you please not do that? Miranda asked from out of nowhere. He literally stopped at those words. Say what now? Could you please stay in full immersion? Why would I do that? 
How would I lead from in here? The church delivered a modification that the Akatsuki had been working on since it was fully developed. It was installed along with the rest of the upgrades. Still doesn't explain why you would want me to stay in here. Just because he could, he folded his arms and started tapping his foot. Gaki, relax, Karama told him. She's getting there. He knew that she was and promptly stopped tapping the foot. But he kept the arms folded. The modification will allow you to observe and direct from a person's camera on their armor. Do the armors have cameras? We installed them recently, she answered without missing a step. If proven, it'll allow improvements to tactical combat situations. You mean it'll let leaders lead from the back safely? She didn't have to dress it up. Personally, while he didn't exactly look down on those kinds of leaders, there was some loss of respect. He was the kind of leader who led from the front. He had always been on the front lines fighting alongside the rest of them. Yes, just get it done and over with son told the blonde. It's not like you're going to get your ass shot off doing it. Thank you for pointing out the obvious, he replied. All right, fine, but we're not making this a regular thing, Miranda, he said aloud. He belonged on the front lines. As you say, Commander, she replied. Now there are still a couple of things that the program is working out. You will be able to switch between cameras but I ask that you keep the switching to a limit as it might crash the system and leave you blind to what's going on. Also, you will only be able to switch between three cameras. Fine, whatever you say. Commander, this is important. I know it's important, Miranda. I got it the first time around. Do I need to do a little dance or song to switch between the cameras? Or would you just prefer me just praising the great and almighty elusive man? Commander, please. She didn't sound exactly exasperated but it was close. Sir, as I much as I enjoy listening to your sarcasm, which is truly a masterful thing, Joker chimed in, the ship is ready to, well, we're in nice company, so I'll say board the enemy ship. What was the term you were going to use, Joker? Naruto asked. Don't be afraid to use it. Mounting the other ship, he answered, probably without blinking. I've known some cruder guys call it ship rape. On second thought, never mind. Go back to boarding, I'll say. Gah, the image is going through my head right now, cried Shikaku as he grabbed hold of his head and shook it. How would that even work? I don't know. Isaba said doing the same thing he was. I can't get them out. The biju, their minds in the gutter since they were created, Naruto thought to himself. Give us some credit, Gaki, Kurama said since puberty. Miranda, have the team get ready, excluding you, he ordered his second in command. Of course, Commander, she replied. It'll help tremendously if I stayed behind and monitor the system in real combat. I had a feeling. Joker came back on the line with an announcement. We're ready to. Keep it clean, Joker. He knew that his pilot could hound someone about something they said for days on end. He'd done it to Caden and Tali back on the first Normandy. I got it the first time. As I was saying, we're ready to board. Do it. He saw the Normandy beginning its pass to the tribal ship. The team is ready, Miranda told him. Good. Have them split into three squads. First squad will breach, second will mop up, and third will raid. Tell Grunt he's in squad one. There was a pause silence for a moment before she spoke again. Is that wise, commander? This would be his first battle, I'm aware. That's why he is in the front. Garis and Ruko will be with him. Jacob, Musashi, and Eric will be the second squad. Morden, Zaid, and Quan Misley will be the last. The ships were getting close together one moving and one staying in place. I would recommend that you place your camera choices with each squad. It gives you a chance to see all of them. I was going to do just that, Miranda. He told her without being snarky or rude. Brevo, Naruto, Karama told him. Shut up. Who do you want the cameras to be placed on? Miranda asked him. He took a moment to consider his decision. Grunt, Musashi, and Mordin, he answered. I will let them know. The line went dead. He watched the ships get closer together. From the way he was looking at it, the Normandy almost did look like it was mounting the other. Don't go there. Shikaka suddenly begged him. We don't need any more images. Okay, okay, I get it. Don't yell in my ear, he replied, wincing at the volume of the Tanuki's voice. Just as the ships were close enough for the boarding to happen, everything went dark. Hey, what happened? Saiken demanded, confused. The answer came when Naruto could see again. This time, he wasn't looking out at space but rather at the docking door. What he was seeing wasn't everything around him, just what laid before him now. Nothing moved when he did the usual gestures with his hands, which told him that he had no control. He began to notice things about this new screen. There was radar at the bottom left, showing that there were two people standing behind him with every full rotation of the blue line. There was a name opposite the radar. Miranda, 
Am I currently looking through Grunt's camera? He asked. Yes, you are, she answered. He should also be able to hear you and reply back. Could you please test that theory out? Grunt, if you can hear me, bring your gun up into firing stance, he ordered. It was a second later, but the heavy machine gun Jacob issued him came up into sight. It was a big brute of a weapon with an even bigger magazine. Yet the Krogan made carrying it look simple. Usually it would take two or more men to do that. Good. Now tell me what you do with that thing. You shoot people with it, Grunt answered shortly. And we're attached, Joker announced. First squad boarding. Stand ready to attack. Fuck yeah, Ruko said as she walked up beside Grunt's right. Her voice sounded off, like he was hearing her speak through a wall that echoed as she spoke. Easy does it, Ruko, Gurus told her, coming into vision on Grunt's left. His voice sounded the same, only deeper, which was expected since he was a guy. You ain't the boss of me, pal, I know that. I just don't think that Naruto would want his sister to die because she ran right into the fight. I have something that'll protect me, it's called my biotics. She replied with very dry sarcasm, folding her arms underneath her chest. Miranda, can I contact the others even though I'm riding with three? Naruto asked. If he could, he would need it to ensure that everything went smoothly. He had seen what could happen when commanding officers weren't there to keep an eye on the troops. Of course, commander, she answered. It'll be on a separate line from the ship. Just give me one second. All he heard of the line changing was a slight blip of a sound. He didn't hear anything from Miranda. Joker or the crew, so he was assuming that he was on the team line. Now he just had to test it out. Boarding squads sound off by the teams, he announced. Garis and Ruka looked a little surprised to hear his voice, and he would guess that Grunt might be as well. But their surprise was brief and they started reporting in. We're here, said Garis. We stand ready behind them, Eric announced. I'm with Eric, Musashi replied. We are ready, Commander Kwan Misley told him. All right, that's good to hear. Do I need to go through what I want you all to do? He asked. I'm not a fucking novice in raiding here, Sade told him with a growl in his voice that showed his impatience. I with him on that, Naruto, Ruko agreed. Musashi and I have held our own in such actions, Eric said. There is no need for you to explain what we must do. He's got a point there, Commander, Miranda agreed. They are all professionals and know what their specialties are, except for Ruko. Heard that, cheerleader, his sister replied. Don't start, you too, he told them before they could. Please stay focused on the mission. And you are all correct, he added. You are professionals and know how to handle this kind of thing, except for Grunt. So that means you get an explanation. You were waiting to use that one, weren't you? Matatabi asked him with a voice trying to detect his suspicion. But he didn't focus on that, choosing to focus on the team and their chorus of groaning. Please spare us that, Gurus asked him. We don't need it, Masashi said. Really, we don't, Jacob added. All three of them had the same note of pleading in their voices as they spoke. Hey, you guys don't want to listen, tune me out. Explanation would be good. Helps refresh goals and objectives, Morden mused. Of course, you would say that, Said groused. Like I said, you don't want to listen, tune me out, Naruto repeated. When he didn't get a reply from any of them, he took it as they understood. Grunt, pay attention, he began. What? His student asked back shortly. You're the first in the boarding party. That means your goal is to plunge deep into the ship and kill everyone who opposes you. Good, he said, growling the word. The blonde could hear the bloodlust beginning to grow in his student just by that word. He couldn't allow that to happen here. Contain that bloodlust, he instantly ordered. You do not have free reign here, grunt. I'll be riding on your shoulder, watching everything you do. You do something I don't give you the all clear for, you will regret it later. Will I be able to use the power here? To the Krogan, chakra wasn't chakra. It was the power. It was an apt description, if a little crude for his tastes. It just sounded so basic and raw. It was calling a steel bat leaks just a sharp rock attached to a stick. But even if they had different names for it, his answers were still the same. Will you? He asked back. Grunt snorted irritably. Can I use the power here? That's better. And no, this time it was a growl. Why not? You're not ready. You need more training before I think you're fit to use it. For now, stick to the gun. First boarding squad, we have control of the door, Joker declared. It's opening in three, two, one. The door opened with a hiss. Go grunt. Naruto thundered. His student let out a roar worthy of a Krogan and charged right into the enemy ship. The edge of the camera became blurry as it moved forward. But even as it blurred, he could see enough to figure out where grunt was going. He was in an airlock tunnel, not unlike the Normandies. As he approached the other airlock, the red light switched to green and it opened. What met them was gunfire, a hail of it. 
The tribe had set up a defensive barrier outside the airlock and was waiting for the first person to show for them to shoot to pieces. Unfortunately, the first person they saw was Grunt. How to take a hit was already ingrained into him by Ochre and his shields were holding. He stood there, letting them shoot him, lips curling up in amusement. But he was the only one who was enjoying it. Grunt, shoot already, ordered Naruto. Don't stand there like an idiot. That's a good way to end up dead. Grunt's machine gun was up and firing as soon as he finished the first sentence. Its roar sounded diluted to the blonde, like he was hearing it over and through the sound of a waterfall. The bullets flew through the air and hit each of the tribesmen he was generally aiming at. When Naruto saw that some of the enemies catching fire, he bit back the word coming out of his mouth. Who gave Grunt a cat on clip? He demanded. That was me. Jacob answered with no shame. Why did you give him a caton clip? I was showing him how to load and fire his gun and he noticed the clip. I explained how it worked and he demanded I give it to him. I figured that since he has chakra and it was already primed, it wouldn't hurt to have him give it a test run. Jacob, run that by me next time, he ordered as he watched the tribe forces get shoved back hard by a blast of red biotics. Ruko strode into sight, her right hand holding her pistol and her left fist wreathed in her biotic power. Understood, Commander, he replied. Giving that clone a chakra clip was a bad idea, Miranda said to the blonde. Don't start, Miranda. It's already happened so we might as well just let it go through. He took her silence as acceptance. Grunt, Ruko, and Gurus move forward. Second squad, move in and mop up. On it, Musashi said. We're heading in, Gurus announced. Grunt's camera showed them moving into the ship, past the soldiers that they killed. What lay beyond was a gray corridor that branched off at an L-shape to the right. The lack of a Turian or a human in the camera's sight meant that Grunt had taken the lead again. Grunt, Argus and Ruko still with you? Naruto asked him as he approached the turn quickly. Yes, the Krogan answered. All right, make sure you stay with them. Getting lost in this ship is not a good idea. I figured that out. I'm not an idiot. Never said you were, Grunt, he replied. They made the turn and found themselves at another hatch. The light was glaring red and they approached it cautiously. When they finally reached it, the light stayed red, which meant they weren't going to have any surprise attacks. Gurus lowered his rifle and activated his omni-tool. He waved over the hatch a couple of times and then stared at it intently. What do we got? Ruko asked him impatiently. It's an elevator and it's locked, he replied, hefting his rifle onto his rack so he had a free hand. Then open it. I'm doing just that. Squads two and three, be advised that the corridor ends with an elevator hatch. Naruto informed them. Squad 1 is currently working to unlock it. Hmm, interesting. Ship has room to spare for separate deck for only airlock, Morden said. Would not be waste money. Organization would not last like that. New design for ship, perhaps? Would help defense and relocation of supplies. Yes. Yes. Quite possible. It would most definitely seem like it, Eric remarked, joining the conversation with a swing of his axe, literally, Naruto could hear the sound of the blade entering flesh. This long corridor would make it ideal for defense against intruders if this was the only airlock. There, I got it, Gurus announced as the elevator hatch opened. That was almost too easy. His squad moved into the elevator. The doors closed before any of them said a word or pushed a button. What the fuck? Ruko demanded. Fuck the ancestors. I knew that was too easy. Gurus swore, already at his omni-tool. Gurus, talk to me. I need details, Naruto ordered. He could see that the elevator was moving upward by the screen next to the hatch. It was moving upwards not to the next deck, but the one after it. They lured us in with the elevator. The locked hatch was a trick. Hang on, I'm hacking in now. He typed away at his omni-tool. Grunt, stand ready. The Krogan hefted his weapon into sight once more. Hang on, hang on, Gurus told him, still concentrating on the omni-tool. The elevator was still moving, going further and further up. Hurry the fuck up. Ruko shouted at him. Ruko, calm down, said Naruto. He's doing his thing. Shouting at him won't make it happen any faster. Fine, she growled out, flexing her free hand. Fortunately for them, it didn't take long for Gurus to shout there. I've got it. The elevator came to a stop as he removed his hand from the Omni-Tool. Good job there, Gurus, the blonde told him. Thanks, but what do we do now? I say that we give them what they wanted, Ruko declared. I like that plan. Grunt said in agreement, still holding his gun at the ready. No, they want that. Gurus programmed the elevator to go to the first deck, Naruto told him. Do a sweep of the ship by deck. There's only one elevator on the ship, Naruto, the Turian informed him. How do you know? 
I did a scan of the ship when I first hacked into the elevator control system and got a basic layout. We're in the only elevator aboard the ship. Send layout. We'll see if it corresponds, Morden said, still on the Normandy. I know how to read a layout. Just do it, Gurus. Fine, he said with an irritated sound. I think you hurt his feelings, Saiken commented. He can handle it, Naruto replied shortly. He's a Turian. They take pride in their skills. And one of Gurus's skills is that he is a capable hacker. There's the word to remember. Capable, Sun said. Sun's right. Their Jinchuriki agreed with the Yanbi. When it came to hacking, Gurus wasn't the one I went to. That was Tali. Ah, uh, see solution, Morden announced. What do you got, Morden? He asked. Gurus was correct. Only one elevator on ship. Thank you, the Turian chimed in. However, he missed something. What? No, I didn't. Yes. Not completely at fault, though. Quite easy to miss if you're not looking. And what would that be? The emergency staircase, the Salarian answered. The what now? Roko asked. Emergency staircase, he repeated. Actually, must apologize. Use the wrong word. Ramp would be more accurate description. Pole 2. What are you getting at, Morden? We're on a time limit here, Naruto reminded him. In and out, that's what they were here to do, similar to a spine and body. Can allow crew to reach other decks when elevator is non-functional. Would like to point out that Normandy does not have one. Per planning and ship design, noted, now where is the staircase on the first deck? On other side of ship, away from elevator, he answered. Okay then. He turned his attention back to the camera where he could see a somewhat annoyed Gurus. Gurus, head to the first deck, do the sweep, and then take the staircase up to the next deck repeat the process to the elevator. With any luck, you catch the tribe forces off guard with attacking from behind. Got it, he said shortly, already on his omni-tool. See? I told you he's upset, Saiken declared. Not now. He had to make sure that Grunt was going to be fine, and that meant keeping watch as he fought. The elevator came to a stop and the hatch opened, revealing an empty corridor. Move forward. Ruko, take point, grunt, support her, and Gurus, hang in the back with the rifle. Don't worry about searching. Keep the main path clear. Who's going to take care of the searching? Gurus asked as they moved out of the elevator and into the corridor. That'll be the others. Second squad, you take care of the people left on the deck. Third squad, you'll raid if there is something worthwhile on the deck. Got it, Musashi said. Understood, Morden said too. Should we move in now? Quan Misli asked. No, wait for my call. Squad 2, status update, he ordered. We are fine, Jacob replied. Just finished up with the initial defense and are currently heading to the elevator. Stand by so I can check, okay? Okay. He took his gaze away from Grunt's camera, which showed that they were still in the corridor and they were coming up on a T-section. He looked up and called out EDI. Yes, Commander? The ship's AI spoke. How do I switch cameras? Point your finger at Grunt's name. He did that and held it there. After a couple of seconds, Grunt's name lit up and two other names appeared above his. They were Musashi's and Morden's. Ten bucks says I have to move my finger to one of those names, he said to the Biju. No bet, they replied together. In perfect unison, very impressive, he remarked. Just shut up and get to it, Gaki, Karama told him. He moved his finger up to Musashi and held it there. The name lit up and the camera view changed. He was looking at the initial corridor again and the bodies on the ground. I'm with you, Musashi, he told the man. Give me a quick pan so I can see the rest of the bodies. You got it, Musashi said, the camera already beginning to turn. Naruto could see all the bodies of the tribe force dead on the ground. Most were shot to death. Some had broken bones that killed them. Whether it was from the biotic blast or the bakken was anyone's guess. And some looked like they had been hacked apart by an axe. Mostly head from body. All right, move on ahead. He switched back to Grunt's camera. They were still in the corridor, but it was straight again. They probably chose a path on the T-section. Anything? Nothing so far, Ruko replied. She was leading at the front like he had told her to do. Keep an eye out. Duh, she said with a sneer. He didn't see her face, but he knew that it was there. Could you stop being such a backseat driver? Sorry, he apologized. I'm just used to being there with you. This hanging in the back is something I wasn't planning on actually doing. Just focus on Grunt not going nuts. That's something coming from you, Ruko. Gurus commented. She looked back with a glare. Don't start, stay focused, Naruto ordered. They got the hint and fell silent. The rest of the walk through the deck was uneventful. They ignored each and every door they passed until they reached where the emergency staircase was located. The entrance itself was a hole-shaped hatch in the corridor. It looked barely big enough for Grunt to get through. It had the height, just not the width. This might be a problem, Gurus said, looking at the entrance. He had already hacked the controls so it was open. 
What they could see beyond just looked like a mixture of blackness and gray lighting. Hold on, I think I can make it wider with my biotics, Ruko said, holstering her pistol and flaring her biotic power. Before anyone could stop her, she grabbed the sides of the hole and pulled them apart. Everyone who could hear it had their ears filled with the sound of screeching metal. It was a sound that burrowed into their ears and hammered relentlessly on the eardrum. Ruko looked like she didn't hear, keeping her focus on widening the hole. She found that the metal was tougher than she had expected. Getting it to open would be difficult, but she wasn't going to stop just because it was slightly harder. That just meant she had to be harder than the metal. In the end, she was victorious. The hole was slightly wider, enough so that Grunt could get through without a problem. There we go, she declared. If they hadn't heard us before, they will have now, Gurus told her. That was loud. We are wasting time to kill our enemies, Grunt said to them both. Move or I will kill you myself. They stopped, looked at each other, then at him, and promptly stepped out of the way. He crouched down slightly and stepped into the hole, throwing his gun in first. The way he moved was with one foot going in before the other, sideways. He almost looked like a crab doing it. Gurus and Ruko followed him. Move over, big guy. Ruko told Grunt, already shimmering across the front of his body, trying to get to the ramp. It's tight in here as it is. That's not my fault, he growled at her. Didn't say it was, just told you to move over, she replied, finally getting over to his other side. There we go. Grunt, look up for a moment, Naruto ordered. All he could see here was just a wall and moving bodies. He needed to see what the rest of the place looked like. The camera swerved upwards. The ramp went upwards at right corner turns giving it a square rotation look. The pole coming straight down the center was thick enough to hold a Turian's, a Ceres, or Solarian's weight, which would have been the point. The emergency lighting, a dull gray that did just enough to light the darkness, was on. The ceiling looked far off but not that far. From the camera, he had no idea how far it was and what that meant, but he knew who could. EDI, calculate the height of the ceiling from their current position and then figure out the number of decks there are on the ship from that calculation. Scanning and calculating now, the AI replied. He was left in silence and waited there for the answer. It didn't take her long. Scan and calculation complete. Judging from the height of the ceiling to the floor and the shape and design of the shape, there are three decks above squad one. You guys get that? Yeah, we better start climbing, Gurus replied. Ruko was already on the ramp and moving up. Grunt was following her quickly if how often she stayed in view of the camera was anything to go by. She would vanish from sight at the corners for about a second. Squads 2 and 3 be advised that there are three remaining decks from Squad 1's current position. Squad 2, where are you at right now? We're on deck 4, mopping up, Jacob replied. Any hostile contact? Negative. We seem to have found the sleeping quarters. Find the captain's room, if there is one. There should be something there for the third squad. Acknowledge, he replied. Third squad, move in. Moving, Quan Misley replied. So, everybody's moving now, Gyuki stated. Thank you for stating the obvious, Captain. Sun told him with the utmost sarcasm he could muster. Shut up. That's a good idea, Naruto said to them both as he kept his attention on the camera. I wonder if there's a night vision on this thing. There is, Miranda told him. What? There is? Why didn't you tell me about that at the start? You know what, never mind. He was about to ask how to activate it when he saw that Ruko had stopped moving. Her faint frame stood in front of Grunt's camera. Ruko, what's the problem? No problem, she replied. Then why are you standing still? I found the hatch. He paused, letting that information sink in. Let me guess, it's locked. Yep, I'm looking at red here. Gurus, any chance you can hack it from where you are right now? No, I have to get in closer, Gurus replied. I think that if Grunt can press his back against the wall, I might be able to get around him and up to Ruko. You won't, Grunt said shortly. The ramp is too small and I take up too much space. Relax, guys, Ruko said. I got this. Ruko, what are? He could barely see the redness wreathed around her hand in the gray light. No, don't. But it was too late. She struck the hatch with her fist. It took five strikes before she finally got through the hatch, popping it out like she was opening a bottle. But each time she hit it, it sounded like she was striking iron with a hammer, only with a sound system to back her up with each hit. There we go! She declared cheerfully, lowering her fist. You want to try and get it louder next time? I don't think the rest of the ship heard you. Gurus snapped at her. I don't know about the rest of the ship, but this deck certainly heard her, Naruto announced, looking at the radar. You guys have multiple targets coming right to your position. There were many dots coming closer to the radar's center from the north. See? See what you did? 
The Turian demanded of Ruko. Gurus, not now, he warned. Grunt, can you get to the hatch? If she moves, yes, Grunt answered. Hey, I've got a name, Ruko told him. Don't care. Now move. She growled at him and he returned it, their voices echoing in the shaft. You guys want to save it for later? Naruto said, getting their attention. Grunt, get to the hatch and stick your gun through. He's going to have to lie down to see, Naruto, Gurus told him while Ruko moved up the ramp. He's not going to have room on the ramp to do that. Then he'll make do. How? He asked. Spray and pray, Gurus. Spray and pray. Good, Grunt said in agreement, his voice rumbling with excitement. He moved to the hatch and settled the gun on its rim. Keep it out of obvious sight, Naruto told him, watching the radar. The dots were coming closer to the center with steady speed. You don't want to spook them before they get to you. He watched the gun get readjusted. The dots were beginning to slow down. Okay, here they come. Wait for my signal. Let me shoot. Easy, grunt. Just wait for it. The dots were almost at the line he wanted. They just needed to get a little closer. Closer, closer, closer. There. Let it rip. He shouted. Grunt answered with gusto. The dots began blinking out like lights being switched off as he watched the gun bark out flashes of light. He had the feeling that Grunt was grinning. There was shouting coming from outside, but it was muffled and distorted. The remaining dots were backing up on the radar which meant that they had figured out that if they got close, they were liable to end up dead. Unfortunately, that also meant they could stay out of range. The squad was going to have to figure out another way to get them and keep moving forward. Grunt, that's enough, Naruto told his student. Either the machine gun was way too loud for him to hear or he was just too engrossed in shooting to care. Grunt, this time he got through. What? Grunt asked, clearly annoyed by the interruption. That's enough. Back up so Ruko can take over the hatch. As the camera straightened out and backed up, he watched his sister go back to the hatch. Ruko, I want one push from you to put distance between you and them. Step out and do it again. Fucking A. She cheered, her fist already glowing. She swung one punch through the hatch and more dots vanished from the radar. The rest moved further back. She stepped through and a second later, more dots vanished while the rest moved even further back. Grunt, get through and support her, he ordered. The camera didn't move. Grunt? He saw the machine gun suddenly get kicked through the hatch, probably from a kick. What he saw next was a fist being drawn back. Grunt, what are you doing? What do you think he's doing? Coco asked him rhetorically. He's a Krogan with chakra. I told him not to use that. So, Grunt punched the area around the hatch once, and it made a dent. He hit it again and it buckled. Uh, Ruko? Called Gurus. What? I'm a little busy, she responded amidst gunfire. Where are you standing right now? What? You contacted me for that. Just answer the question, please. I'm standing a couple of feet in front of the hatch with a barrier protecting from their fire. Would you guys get the fuck out already? As fun as this is, I'm not going to last out here alone much longer. And here I thought she would never say those words out loud, Isabu remarked. I guess being around Naruto has changed her, Saiken mused, taking on a thinking pose for a six-tailed slug. Karama snorted. You're surprised by it? We're talking about Naruto Uzumaki here. We know, but it's still amazing, the Sanbai told him. Listen, Gurus said. You might want to consider. Grunt punched the hatch one more time and it went flying straight at her. She felt it coming from the air pressure it suddenly gave off and leapt out of the way. Getting out of the way, he finished. Hey, you could have killed me, asshole. She shouted at the Krogan as he stepped out into the corridor proper. I didn't. Focus on the fight, he said shortly. He aimed his weapon at the enemy and opened fire, spraying bullets like fire hose at a burning bush. Oh no, you don't tell me what to do. Pay attention or I will kill you myself. You want to repeat that, grunt? Naruto asked him instantly. He didn't stop his shooting when he said no, in a dead flat voice. Good, because you're in enough trouble as it is. What did I tell you about using your chakra? I didn't. You punched out a wall made of Kami only knows material, and you expect me to believe that you didn't use your chakra? Yes. I am a Krogan, he said simply. He's got a point, Gurus agreed. He quickly appeared from the left, the rifle in his hands shooting an Asari down. All right, just, the screen froze in place, the machine gun spitting out a bullet. Gurus and Ruko stood in front, stopped in mid-action. Guys? He spoke out. Guys, can you hear me? All he got was silence. What's going on? Isabu asked. I don't know. Everything seems to be frozen in place. Are one of you doing this? No. Why would we do this right now? Gyuki asked him. I have to start somewhere. With us? 
asked Saiken, sounding a little bit hurt by the prospect of his accusation. Again, had to start somewhere, he replied. Hey, what's that? Sun asked. What? Look at the screen. When he brought his attention back to the screen, it began to glitch on him. Random parts were flickering or fading or doing the former than the latter. It was tiny and spread out first, but then it began to grow and creep towards each other. Creep might not have been the best word that could describe the merging bits, but it was the best that he could think of at that moment. What is going on? He asked as he watched spread. You're asking us? Karama asked back. We don't have a clue. Who else am I going to ask, huh? There has to be a reason for this, Coco suggested. Perhaps the tribe was able to launch a virus against the Normandy. Joker would have said something and instantly ordered the crew to counterhack. Perhaps it was so quick that he wouldn't have noticed it before it was too late. You saw this happen back in the war. That isn't technically the same thing, Chome protested slightly. That was poisonous gases and viruses aimed to cripple and kill agonizingly. This is a hacking. It's the same basic principle, Chome. It's speed and devastation. Oh yeah, good point. It still doesn't explain why this is happening to me right now, Naruto argued. This system is mostly Cherka-based. How could a virus get into it? We're talking about the tribe here, Naruto, Sun told him. We don't know what they could have cooked up to use against Chakra. Any suggestions to get me back into contact with the rest of the crew? No, I don't. He dragged it out just for the emphasis. How about the obvious choice here, Gaki? Asked Karama. That is, if you can actually remember it. Karama, I don't think now is the time for your particular brand of harsh sarcasm, Matatabi told him. I agree with her, Naruto said. Why don't you just tell me what you mean? Disconnect your chakra from the system. Okay, that's fair. Why didn't I think of that? He asked. Well, shut up. I wasn't talking to you. How about? Shikaka began. I wasn't talking to you either. What? Chome said. Not you either. Well, started Sun. Or you. You didn't let me finish. He rolled his eyes at that protest. Fine. What were you going to say? Who were you talking to? Myself. Duh. Fine. He clasped his hands together. But before he could cancel out his chakra, the camera went completely dark, leaving him in the darkness. An old reflex kicked in, and he went still for a second. The camera began to light up again and he relaxed. That was quick. I guess that Joker and the crew pulled through. Wait, that's not Grunt's camera, Gyuki said, watching the camera. Naruto looked at the screen again when he heard those words. As it got clearer, he saw that it wasn't a ship he was looking at. It was a room with a table in it. He had seen that room before, in his dreams. Quickly, people began to form, coming into existence around the table. He wasn't surprised to see that people he knew. What he was surprised was it was happening now while he was awake. What do you mean they won't hand them over? Sakura shouted. She gripped the table so hard he was surprised there weren't chunks torn off. She stood on one end with Ino and Sasuke by her side. Shikamaru stood on the other end, completely alone. Just what I said, Sakura, he told her. And it's not so much won as can't. What does that mean? The entire country was baying for their blood once the details about Unrakyo were released. The High Yarl had sent out parties to bring them in to answer for what they did but they were already gone. All that was left was a note by the head of the Ver Clan. She gripped the table tighter. Sasuke placed a hand on her shoulder and from what Naruto could see it could have either been comforting or potentially restraining. What did the note say? Ino asked her teammate. Something along the lines of we did as we were ordered. We will not be punished for it. The High Yarl has his people looking throughout Midgard to find them but no luck so far. I want them. Sakura growled at him. I want their heads. It doesn't look you'll be getting them, Sakura. They're gone. No. Yes, he said back, keeping his voice calm like he always did. It wasn't bored like he usually sounded, but it was calm. No. She tore her grip off the table and slammed a fist down on it. The sound of flesh hitting wood and cracking it echoed through the room, also distorting itself to Naruto's ears. The table's crack spread from where she struck outward like a web, reaching the other end. But despite her fury, Naruto knew her strength. The fact that it hadn't split completely in half meant that she was still holding back. It's done, Sakura. There's nothing you can do, Ino told her gently. She reached out to take her hand off the table, keeping her grasp light. Midgard's been beaten, take solace in that. But her butchers are still out there, she said, her angry tone now turning into grieving sadness. I know, I know. But there's nothing you can do. Naruto wouldn't have wanted you to be like this. Normally, Naruto would have said that using his name to evoke something without him being there was a low blow. But he had to guess that Sakura already told the rest of the Kanoha 12 about what happened in the throne room, so he let it pass. 
Besides, there was nothing he could do about it. The sadness and anger froze and then steeled itself into something else. No, he wouldn't, his old teammate agreed, shrugging off her friend's grasp. He would have wanted me to forgive them. But that won't happen. The other three looked at each other when she said those words, realization and growing worry evident in their eyes. Naruto began to have the same feeling they did. Sakura, Shikamaru began to say, Don't try saying anything, Shikamaru, she cut him off. I will never forgive the Midgardians for what they condoned. If I can have the butchers, I will hold the rest of them responsible. The room was silent as her words hung in the air. They were dangerous words, ones that could promise something more if something else happened that turned her mood darker against Midgard. But before she could even think on that, Sasuke placed his hand on her shoulder, around the back of her neck. Let's just go home, Sakura, he said to her quietly. Our children are waiting for us. She looked at the hand for a second and then at him. The steeliness in her eyes vanished. Yes, let's go home, she said in quiet agreement, leaning into him. Ino and Shikamaru watched silently as the two of them left the room. As the door closed with barely a creak, Ino breathed out a large sigh of relief. Thank Kami that's over. She looked over to her teammate. What did the rest of that note say? What do you mean? He asked. I know you, Shikamaru. I know you well enough to recognize the tone in your voice when you're hiding something from others. I don't have a tone in my voice, he said in protest, as much as he could protest. Shikamaru sounded the same after all these years. Yes, you do. Now what did the rest of that note say? Troublesome woman, he muttered half-heartedly. Usually she would have been annoyed or playfully amused at that. She wasn't now. Shikamaru, what did it say? It was addressed to Sakura. It said tell the pink-haired bitch that if she wants us, she'll have to come get us. Poetic, Naruto thought drilly. Not at all, Chome disagreed. It's blunt and a little bit crude. Whoever wrote that was trying to antagonize her. Sakura can never know about that part, Ino said instantly, her face locked up in an expression of horror and worry. She won't hear it from me, Shikamura said. I'm already beginning to think that she's closer to the edge than we previously thought. What does that mean? There was a moment after one of the battles where she saw a Midgardian warrior, just a kid really, laying on the ground. He was so badly injured that it would have been better to give him a mercy killing. And what did Sakura do? She just stood there and watched him die. She didn't even try to save him. Her eyes widened at that sentence, showing just how shocked she was. But that goes against everything Tsunade told us. Are you sure you saw that? With my own two eyes, Eno, he confirmed. She watched him die and did nothing. The kid was whimpering in pain, crying for his mother. I was the one who ended his life, not her. Merciful Kami, she whispered her eyes still wide with shock and horror. If Kami was merciful, it was only because the rest of the invasion force was there behind her. He scowled the scowl that he only reserved for himself when he thought he hadn't done enough. I should have sent her home long before we reached the capital. We both know that she would have stayed behind, Shikamaru. She was too focused on this. But now I'm afraid that the Sakura we've known all our life isn't with us anymore. I'm afraid of that too, he told her. It showed on his face, heavy with concern, thought, and outright worry. Oh man, huh? Said Naruto, looking around out of habit and reflex. Did you guys say something? It wasn't us, Saiken replied. But look, the screen's frozen, Isabu pointed out. He looked back at the scene. It was frozen on Shikamaru and Ino staring worriedly at the door. It was a concerning picture, one that made him want to try and see what came next. But he didn't know how to make that happen. He was stuck. Command, is that getting louder? He asked. It sounded familiar but distorted and fuzzy, like trying to get a signal out of a bad radio. I think it is, Gyuki agreed. The screen's going to black, Shikaka said in idle comment. The frozen screen was already fading away when he spoke disappearing into a black void. Commander! shouted Miranda, her voice suddenly crystal clear. The screen came back alive and he was staring out Grunt's camera again. He was looking out at a corridor the same color as the tribe ship, which meant he was still on board. But even so, he was caught off guard by the shout. Gah! he shouted, wincing at the volume of it and almost leaping out of his skin. There's no need to shout, Miranda! He rubbed his ears, trying to make sure they were still working. Commander, we lost contact with you. The squads completed their mission while you were gone. He stopped rubbing his ears. What? He quickly looked at the screen. While it showed Grunt's name and the machine gun he was holding, there was something different about it. There were no people trying to shoot the Krogan dead. I knew you were lazy, Gaki, but not this lazy, Karama said. This is on a Nara scale of laziness. Way to go. Shut up, furball, he snapped at the fox. Miranda, 
How long was I gone? He asked aloud. Almost an hour, she replied. Geez, that long? He was going to have to check in with the others. Guys, it's me. Tell me you can hear me. Nice to hear your voice again, Commander, Gurus replied. Was wondering where you vanished. Did not bother to follow up, Morden told him. It is relieving to hear your voice again, Commander, Eric said. It took you long enough, Musashi spoke shortly. I hear you, Commander, Quan Misley called in. The same, Jacob added. What? You were gone? Zaid asked snidely. Where the fuck were you? Ruko demanded. All he got out from Grunt was, ironically, a grunt of acknowledgement. How did the mission go? He asked once they were all checked in. It went fine, Grunt told him. Not exactly, Gurus said right after. What does that mean, Gurus? What happened? Soon after you disappeared on us, Grunt went wild. He was silent for a moment, taking that information in and processing it. He wasn't angry that his student had run wild. He wasn't even surprised. They were still new to this relationship and they had to work on it. How wild? He asked the Turian. When he ran out of ammo, he charged forward and swung his gun around like it was a club, he answered. On the screen, he walked into sight. And I'm guessing that you didn't even try to stop him from doing that? It was redundant question. But it was still one that needed to be asked. I've been on the receiving end of a rampaging Krogan before. I wasn't going to get in the way of one who could use chakra. Besides, it was directed at the tribe, so I figured that it was a good thing somewhat. Uh Uh-huh. Grunt, what do you have to say in your defense? He asked his student. Now came the time to see if he would try to bullshit his way out of this, making up excuses, or just admit to what he did. His answer was simple. I didn't use my power, and you think that'll save you from being in trouble right now? Naruto asked him instantly, his voice becoming stern. His face would have done the same if they could see it. You said I couldn't use my power. I didn't. I also told you to contain the bloodlust. You didn't. Ruko didn't help the matter either, Gurus supplied. She just grinned and went after him, howling like a crazy person. Fuck you, Gurus. Ruko shouted at him. You don't need to blab to him about what I did. She came into view, leaping at Gurus and taking a swing at him, which he promptly dodged. Ruko, ease off him. Naruto barked out instantly stopping the fight before it got any worse. She didn't throw any more punches but she did glare at Gurus. Now are there any more tribe forces left alive on the ship? We went through the ship deck by deck, like you told us to, she replied. Anyone who got in the way, we bulldozed through them. All right, squad two, how was the mop up? Swift, Musashi answered. There were few left alive for us to take care of. We also located the science lab. It took up half of deck two. Good. Squad three, do you find anything useful? Found interesting items in the lab, Morden answered. Like what, Morden? He asked. His interest was raised and wanted to know. Notes, papers, will not know what they hold until they're brought back. We also hit the jackpot, Zaid declared. Whoever was in charge of the main computer was either an idiot or wasn't quick enough. Either way, we've got a list of ships' last locations and planets the tribe has bases on. They won't know what happened when we hit them. Sounds like you got a break. Sun commented. That's just his luck, Karama retorted. I'll take it either way, he silently told the fox. Morden, Zaid, bring the information you found back to the ship. Have the locations get run through by EDI. Morden, start working on those papers. Of course, the doctor replied. Everyone else, do one last check and then get back to the ship. Miranda, get me out of this thing, now. You can take care of that yourself, Commander, Miranda told him. Just go through the usual procedure for exiting out of full immersion. He did just that, disconnecting his chakra from the system and finding himself back inside the Normandy. Phew, he breathed out in relief, leaning against the railing. He didn't know why, but he suddenly felt really winded. Is everything okay, Commander? Kelly asked beside the stairs. Yeah, I just need a minute, he told her, still leaning against the railing and focusing on his breathing. Oh, get up, you big baby, Shikaka ordered. You're acting like you went through something exhausting. He ignored the tanuki, choosing to stand back up proper after a couple of seconds. When the teams get back in, have Grunt come see me, he told Kelly, walking down the steps. He and I need to have a talk and a lesson. Yes, sir, she answered. She paused for a second and then spoke again just as he was walking by. Commander, may I speak honestly? What's up? He asked, coming to a stop and looking at her with curiosity. I think that you might be getting too involved in what we are doing. It's beginning to weigh on you. I can see it. Okay? That sounded like a good deal of nonsense to him, and he was certain that she had more to say about it. But she didn't continue speaking and the silence dragged on for another couple of seconds. You mind telling me what you're thinking about? Commander, 
I think it would be a good idea for you to sit down with me for a session in the near future, she told him. Even though she asked him to do this, her voice showed her uncertainty about it. He caught that uncertainty and went after it. You want me to do a session? I'll tell you something. That won't help me. You don't know that, sir. Oh, trust me, I know. I went to a couple of therapy sessions back during the war, and they did squat for me. Sir, the answer is no, yeoman, he told her with a firm voice instead of his casual one that people normally heard. I won't have a session. We both have better things to do. Hearing that tone in his voice, she realized that she wouldn't get what she wanted. Fine, she knew better than to push it. But she was going to insist on one thing. At the very least, please find something that will take you away from the mission for at least a few minutes. Keeping focus on it won't be good for your health. This time she was firm. He had something to say to that. We're in deep space hunting a shadow organization that's trying to unlock the secret to Chakra while also trying to get me back with no actual support from recognized government. What exactly would you suggest that would take my attention away from the mission? I cannot answer that, Commander. You will have to. He rolled his eyes. Thank you for that straight answer. Naruto, wait a minute, Manitabi said before he could walk away. What? He asked with annoyance. She could help with, you know, your dreams? Normally, he would have dismissed that idea outright. But the dreams and visions were still coming to him. It caused that blackout in full immersion. Maybe the Nibby was onto something. Maybe there is something I need to talk about, he said to Kelly. She had been turned halfway back to her when he said that, and she whipped back around so fast, he could have sworn he heard a whip snapping. What would that be, Commander? He frowned at her. I'm not going to tell you here. He gestured to the command deck. I'll call you up to the den later. Ah, yes. I understand. She looked a little embarrassed to have jumped the canai like so. Thank you. He turned from her and kept on walking. It was about four hours later, after getting the teams back in the ship, ensuring that the information found on the enemy ship went to the right places, ensuring that the Normandy was out of the system, having that talk with Grunt that turned into a lesson that left both of them smarting, that he was able to sit down and get something to eat. It didn't take long for someone to sit down at the mess table with him, and that turned out to be Musashi. So, as far as first raids go, I'd say that one went well, the former CCC said to the shinobi. Yeah, it did, he agreed. But that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. The woods got bigger because of what we found. That just means a better chance for us to find enough dirt on these guys to shut them down completely. I'll stick to making sure they don't figure out how to use my chakra and finding out what the hell they did to me. He turned his attention back to the meal in front of him, eating for a minute or so. He wasn't sure exactly what it was but it tasted fine and went down his throat easily enough. He could deal with that. Tell me something. What? The Bakken wielder asked him. How does a guy working in CCC go to hunting mercs on Omega? You asked this question of every guy who worked with Gerst there? He wondered aloud before his mood turned somber. If so, you're going to be talking to a lot of graves. We buried a lot of people in our time there. I'm sorry, he offered. He lost count of how many times he had said those words to people who had lost people. Was your fault that they died? Musashi asked, his somber mood passing as quickly as it had come on. No, but I am not inconsiderate. It doesn't bother me none. They're dead, I'm not. Simple as that, he declared. That's harsh, Matatabi declared. That's a guy who's lost a lot of people, Sun replied. He had been inside a few Jinchuriki who had gone through that. Either they had turned out like Musashi or became really bitter about life. It didn't help how the other people treated them. It just added to the problem. So, how do you get there? Naruto asked again. The honest truth? He asked rhetorically. I wanted to come out of retirement. He stood up and went over to the kitchen area. Naruto watched idly as he argued with the chef about something, eating as he watched. He was intrigued by what the man had said and he wasn't the only one. He wanted to come out of retirement? Chome repeated, sounding completely mystified by what he had said. That's what I heard, Koko said. That's interesting. You should investigate, Saiken told Naruto. You think? He asked back sarcastically. Why didn't I think of that? No need to get snide about it. He's coming back, Shikaku announced as Musashi sat back down at the table with a plate of food in his hand. What do you mean by retirement? The blonde asked the Bakken wielder. I thought you were in CCC. I was, he replied. That was my retirement. Most people don't consider that a retirement. They consider that to be a career. And he would be one of those people. Musashi just snorted. Those people would be lightweights. After what I've been through, chasing down and locking up people is a retirement. Odds are I would have considered it a career and I'd been through worse than you. 
Yeah, well, and I would be very careful about what you say next, he added as he ate. I fought through a war that was literally hell on earth. The Bakken wielder shut his mouth at that, killing any comment he might have had. It stayed like that for another couple of seconds before he finally said good point. But that doesn't mean I haven't been through crap of my own. Like what? The blonde asked, his warning tone of voice replaced with curiosity. Like the Loric recovery, the Blitz, Tor fan, he answered. I was active during those years. Once it was all done, I had had enough. So I retired to CSEC. But once I was there, I ran into trouble of my own with the tribe. That got his attention. You did? Yeah. They were trying to kidnap chakra scientists visiting the citadel. I caught wind and organized an informal task force to counter them. It worked. Not a single scientist was taken. But they caught and set up an ambush for us. One of my guys got killed. So I went after the head, the huntress, as Sovereign attacked the citadel. After that, well, he shrugged. I realized that my career in CSCC was pretty much over. Handed in my resignation and went to Omega. Ran into Gers a few weeks in and joined up. It sounded like there was more to the story than he was letting on. There was one point Naruto had a problem with. If you went after the Huntress, why is she still alive? Musashi didn't seem to be the kind of person who would just give up after losing sight of his target. She isn't. The Huntress we saw on Omega is different from the one I dealt with. She's younger, for one thing. Less cold. Definitely more arrogant. Okay, so that answered that question. Something else came to Naruto about what he said. The Blitz and Tor fan, he repeated. I think I read something about those two. Wasn't there one guy who stood out at each? He remembered the piece about the attacks but could not remember the person who stood out. Musashi frowned slightly, a piece of food hanging from the spoon in his mouth. The saint and the demon, those guys? He asked, taking the spoon out. He nodded. I think that might be them. Did you know them? His reply was unfortunately yes. It was short and clipped, completely different from he had been saying a few seconds ago. Naruto noticed the change and stopped eating to look at him. Why unfortunately? Did you hate them or something? He shook his head. No, not that, he said back. I just get sick and tired of people glorifying them like they're heroes. They were just soldiers who did what they had to do, same as the others they were with. The only difference is that they lived while the others died. H.M., the shinobi said to himself, Are you trying to channel Sasuke now? Kurama asked when he heard the sound. It sounded way too close to what the Uchiha would say. That's H.N., he corrected the fox. I don't care, just don't do it. What's with the H.M.? Musashi asked. Just thinking, he told him. It sounded like you knew those soldiers personally. Yeah, I guess you could say that, he conceded. Both Kojiro and I served alongside them. We knew them, but not that well. I thought you said that they were the only ones who survived. Sorry, I misspoke. They were the ones who were still on the battlefield when the fight was over, the cop quickly explained. Everyone else was either dead or injured enough to be taken off the field. Like you? Yeah, like me. I lasted damn near that entire fight, only to get three bullets in my chest that sent me crashing to the ground and into unconsciousness. When I came to, I was in the hospital, the fight was over and everyone was talking about the saint like they had known him personally. A disgusted look came onto his face as he spoke those words. It was clear that whatever had happened to him happened in much more detail and left him with a bad memory. What about Kojiro? I don't know. I don't keep track of him everywhere he goes. I guess he survived the battle. If he hadn't, he wouldn't be on Omega. He turned his attention to his food, resuming with his eating. The way he ate was like he was on his last day alive. That was true, Naruto could concede that. But that still left another question over his head. What exactly is the relationship between you and Kojiro anyway? Musashi went still at those words. His eyes flashed with irritation and barely restrained anger. That's none of your business. It is my business, Naruto told him. You're on my ship and on my team. That makes it my business. His body started to tremble, probably more from rage than fear. But then he looked at his left hand, closing and opening it a couple of times closed his eyes and took a deep breath. You've got a point, he finally said, opening the eyes. Thank you. Now, what is your relationship with Kojiro? We served together throughout that time and left on uncertain terms, if you want to be wordy about it. I don't, he said bluntly. That man wanted to kill you but also keep you alive at the same time. I think you could call that a complicated relationship, says the pot to the kettle, Karama remarked with a very dry amount of amusement. Shut up, I wasn't talking to you, he replied. You are now. 
Besides, you know it's true. As was his usual choice in this kind of conversation with the fox, he ignored him. So, do you mind explaining it to me? He asked Musashi. I'd rather not, he replied. Now he looked nervous and afraid then angry. It's a long story. I have the time. And he was beginning to get suspicious. Maybe some other time, the Bakken wielder quickly finished the rest of the food in front of him. He stood up and walked back to the kitchen to leave the dishes with the cook. He was polite in that, despite his speech and manners sometimes. You're letting him go like that? Shikaku asked. He'll come to me, Naruto assured him. They always did for some reason or the other. Just answer me this question before you run away, Musashi, he said, making the man stop before he could get too far away. He looked back over his shoulder. What question? Which one was he, the saint or the demon? The way he was acting all about it, Arya's swordsman had to be one of them. But Musashi did not answer the way he wanted. What makes you say that? He asked in return. He didn't wait around for an answer, leaving the mess area quickly, like someone trying to run away from an unfortunate past. Codex Entry Religion the Church of the Nine. The beginnings of the Church of the Nine, or Niners, as they are derisively called, are different from what the modern-day person would believe. Their origins date back to the end of the Fourth Shinobi World War, beginning as the reminder of the Konoha Twelve would gather and reminisce about their lost member, C. Naruto Uzumaki. Their reminiscing would bring in people who wished to hear about the hero who ended the war, and they were regaled with his tales. It became so popular that even when the Twelve had stopped, they continued as a separate group. The group became researchers, looking into the life of not only Naruto Uzumaki and the Kyubi but the other Biju and their Jinchurikis. The conversion to from scholars to religion occurred because of the War of Three Flags. Many joined the war for the shinobi and invoked Naruto Uzumaki as a battle cry. They came to believe that he imbued them with strength and courage whenever they called upon them and that he was watching over them with the power of the Nine Biju at his back. By the time the war had ended, the Church of the Nine began to form. There was initial disagreement over church doctrine. One side of the church believed that Naruto had ascended into godhood while the other side believed that it was the Biju who were the gods and that Naruto had been chosen to become their avatar. It was an argument that lasted for five years before one side had the other completely wiped out. From then on, there was one doctrine of the church and they spread it throughout earth. The church was not seen as hard-lined and extreme until the Relay 314 incident. Shanxi had been the home of several church practitioners and places of worship. As such, they were outraged at the attack and by how the alliance joined the council. They protested and said that humanity should rule, not follow. They have been mostly ignored by the galaxy, until Naruto Uzumaki was discovered, having crash-landed on Thesha. Since then, the number of people being converted has been going up. The structure of the church is hieratical with nine ranks, which are called tales, honoring the nine biju. Priests of the first tale, the beginning rank, wear robes of sand brown. As they ascend the ranks, which supposedly is given by how faithful they are, their robes will be adorned with the colors of deep blue, sea green, crimson red, silk white, pale gray, hardened cobalt, light purple, and fiery orange, in that order. The priests of the ninth tale, even though they do not claim themselves to be so officially, are the high priests of the order. Since Naruto Uzumaki was revealed to the galaxy, there has been no official meeting between him and the religion been made in his image. But the Church of the Nine remains hopeful.